ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to What's New Summit Delhi, a Kid Global Initiative supported by EconomicTimes.com. Let's start this evening by bringing some energy to the room. Wow, much appreciated. Well, in a world where everything is constantly changing, change is the only constant. And the field of digital marketing stands as a true testament to the relentless pace of innovation. And today, we all have gathered here to explore the very essence of transformation by delving into the right strategies, technologies, and trends that will shape the future of how we connect, engage, and inspire through digital mediums. Well, our world is increasingly interconnected. With every scroll, tap, and click, we leave a digital footprint, a trail of data that holds a powerful potential to actually transform the way we tailor our messages, understand our customers, and spark some meaningful and interactive conversations. After all, it's not just about you know, accepting that how we are meeting the expectations, but rather crafting the right and meaningful experiences that resonates. Stories that engage emotionally. Creating campaigns that leave a lasting impact. So this groundbreaking summit aims to act as a definitive platform for all the visionary industry experts to convene and engage into thought-provoking discussions. Well, with a focus on spotlighting the pivotal themes and unveiling the untapped potential that awaits us in the marketing landscape of tomorrow, this summit promises to deliver some unparalleled networking opportunities and deeply insightful sessions. So on behalf of Kid Global and EconomicTimes.com, I, Namrita Sehrawat, your host, once again welcome you all to this evening full of deliberations on the future of Indian digital marketing landscape. So Kid Global is a dynamic and an innovative digital product company that offers a wide range of cutting edge solutions in the field of digital transformation. With an expertise in performance marketing and marketing automation, they empower the organizations to adapt and thrive in this ever evolving digital landscape. And the Economic Times is a leading India's business daily and the most trusted destination for news and information on Indian economy, markets, startups, as well as technology. And in fact, the Economic Times is the most preferable choice for the top influential decision makers and leaders from the top national and global markets, as well as businesses. So with that context set in place, let's kickstart this evening, jumping right into the conversations. I now now invite on stage Mr. Pavel Urovitsky, CEO, Kid Global, to set the context for this evening. Let's give a very warm welcome as he joins us up here. Uh, thank you for starting our event. Uh, as you already know, uh, my name is uh, Pavel Urovitsky, and uh, I am CEO of Kid Global Company. Welcome to our event, What's New Summit. Sorry, I'm a little nervous, so please uh, give me a warm welcome. Thank you. Just a few words about our company. Uh, we launched our company 19 years ago. The very first time uh, my partners and I met in small and cozy kitchen, and we created our company's vision. I was only 19 years old. And this meeting inspired me with uh, fresh perspectives and ambitions. Our vision just have three key points. First, clients are always in the center of our work. Second, ultimate re result commitment. We know that our clients need clear and profitable results from all our tools and services. If you don't make money, why do we do it? And third, all our clients are our partner. 
if you lose money, we lose money together. If you earn money, we earn money together. We are together in a small boat in the huge ocean of digital marketing. During these 19 years, we have created a company that can work with every client as a partner and have provided maximum performance from all our activities. So, how do we do it? First, clear and mutually beneficial results and relationship with all our clients and partners. Uh, second, our own best technologies and best solutions from all over the world. Uh, third, a true borderless company with open mind. Team members from different countries and worldwide experience that we are ready to share with you. And fourth, we don't have any competitors. And, uh, but instead, every company from advertising market could be our partner. The partnership is our DNA. We share our expertise, our experience, and the best practices, how you can see it today. We want to make our clients' business profitable, uh, to create really long-term cooperation. And when I say long-term, I really mean long-term. Hundreds of our clients working with us more than 10 years. We want to create a company that, sorry, <laughs> uh, we want to create a company where we can hire the best specialists and help them to really enjoy their work. Happy clients and good bonuses for good results is our recipe. We want to be transparent for our clients to our partners and team members. We want to share our expertise such we do it today. Let's create new levels of transparency, of performance, expertise and uh, technology together. Everyone here today could be our partner, our associate and our friend. Today we make this event for sharing key future marketing trends, which will we unlock together. I feel your energy today. I feel that I'm surrounded by our current and future partners. I feel inspired from fresh perspectives and ambitions like 19 years ago from my first partners. Now, I want to introduce you our India country manager. Please give a warm welcome to Rahul Hurana. Thank you. Okay, so good evening everyone once again and uh, welcome you all uh, to the first and the inaugural edition of our What's New Summit. And I congratulate my CMO who is the mind behind putting this uh, brand identity together. So this is our, you know, of course, the inaugural edition. This this IP is going to travel to Indonesia, Spain, and many other countries. So I think eighth is when we have a similar kind of event in Indonesia. So uh, I'm acquainted with a lot of you, you know, as uh, you know, like uh, you know, uh, ex colleagues, uh, ex clients. You know, like I have been clients for many of you. So yeah. So. So I will touch upon, uh, you know, how this reset uh, is happening in the digital marketing uh, ecosystem. Of course, no gyan. Uh, I'll try to avoid that. Uh, of course, there are more, more, you know, like far more better experts, you know, whom you're going to hear. This is just my understanding, my observation, uh, and I'll restrict to that. And in fact, this is more from, uh, you know, my experience, uh, you know, spending uh, some time with KIT Global. Yeah. So, so. Okay, uh, I think we keep hearing this, you know, uh, that uh, numbers favor us, uh, you know, in, in, in fact, you know, this reminds me of, uh, you know, one of the interviews of Shah Rukh Khan, you know, he said once that, uh, you know, he, uh, he does not uh, attribute his success to only hard work. 
it is actually about being at the right place at the right time. So I was just wondering, is it our time as marketeers? Are we, you know, like in the country or, you know, in the place where we should be? And, you know, like we have a large addressable marketing market at hand. Stats are in our favor. And everybody wants to look at India, okay? So the other day I was talking to an entrepreneur, uh, uh, and you know he told me that if you're not doing something big in next five years, uh, you you are likely to miss the bus. So I keep hearing such things. So he keeps telling me you might have already missed it. I think it's about you know uh, five years ago was the best time, but now is a good time to do something big with this opportunity. So so I think many of us. Uh, in our marketing careers might uh, encounter an entirely new breed of cons consumers. Uh, consumers who might have never shopped kind of in a brick and mortar model or consumers who might have never imagined content consumption beyond OTT or before OTT. So, you know, like I was ha again having a chat with my niece who's uh, turning 17, 17 very soon. So she doesn't understand the concept of DTH cable. She, she's completely alien to this. And in fact, you know, so if you ask her, uh, you know, so she doesn't understand uh, the concept of going to a supermarket at all. So she's so, you know, like this is, the, in fact, the first shopping experience is happening online. So data, of course, you know, we have people from Groupon, they can or validate or they can put this, but you know, this is what my, you know, like this is what is coming and this is what is uh, going to happen very soon, yeah? Uh, so, so I think scale fast, get, deliver volume for us. Uh, this is the kind of ask I keep, you know, hearing from uh, advertisers, particularly in the e-commerce space. Uh, you know, these are very common questions. You know, can you help us uh, get volume? Can you help us get scale? Uh, and in fact, you know, so like I was just observing my last few conversations. Uh, Advertisers want to work on a paper result model, so I think we are moving from, uh, you know, like completely a paper result model, and they want scale from their partner. In fact, I want to also share a success case. Uh, there is a handset, uh, you know, like player that we work, uh, that we work with. We cater to a prominent brand, uh, you know, in a handset market, uh, and this is why an agency that you know uh, that this work has come from. And uh, within the first month, and right from the outset. Uh, you know, we have delivered a GMV of $1 million. And in fact, our goal is to reach a threshold of about $4 million, uh, you know, in uh, by this festive season. So era of hyper specializations, advertisers are on a lookout for partners who can quickly understand their business. So they do not want to waste this time on a, you know, for a partner to first, you know, like get immersed into their business and then finally, you know, they will uh, start delivering results. So our company has been structured in such a way, has been designed in such a way that we have hyper specialists within the system. Uh, there are domain specialists like, you know, when you speak to, uh, you know, somebody from our company, it's not a performance marketing consultant that you're speaking with, you're talking to an e-commerce consultant perhaps who's who understands performance marketing as well. So that, you know, he speaks the client's language, he speaks the client's, uh, you know, he, he understands the nuances uh, of the industry. So, you know, one, one of the largest e-commerce companies uh, in India, in fact, they are the second largest, uh, you can guess. So they have chosen our platform recently because of our customized solution for e-commerce. Uh, we will be a prominent partner promoting their big, uh, you know, like uh, sale during festivities also. I think this, everybody is aware of it. Uh, you know, more you speak with the marketeers, they want to app up their business as soon as possible. Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do we app up our business? This is the question I'm often asked in meetings these days. More and more, uh, you know, web, web marketers are considering, considering the app, app route. Uh, reasons obviously are, you know, the reduced uh, cost, uh, you know, customer acquisition cost, uh, better loyalty, better, better, kind of uh, measurement, best, better customer minds, consumer mindset. At KIT Global, we are already working with some of the prominent uh, and newly launched mobile applications, uh, advertisers in FinTech and social media space, yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, so this is one of the, like the recent, you know, kind of need that has emerged out of the market. Uh, diverse brands, diverse categories, and each with their kind of unique, uh, measurement tools. So everybody has a different, everybody is using a different measurable tool. So advertisers want partners who can seamless, seamlessly integrate with their tech stack. Okay. So at, again, at, in our company, 
uh, our, we host our customers on our platform, okay, which can integrate very seamlessly into the client's uh, uh, tech stack. Okay, this is very, very important. You know, this is becoming like very frequent kind of discussion, uh, you know, and whenever we speak about performance marketing, uh, advertisers seek better transparency. Uh, there is, there are more integrate, there are more, they're integrating uh, kind of uh, sophisticated anti-fraud tools. Uh, earlier, you know, they used to wait till they reach a scale, but now it is almost a necessity right from the beginning. Uh, the demand for trustworthy partners, even at a premium, I think uh, is increasing. Considering that, you know, time spent in validation uh, also carries its own cost. Uh, so I'll give you a success story also here. Uh, there is a quick credit app uh, that, you know, offers loans in India. Uh, they've highly acknowledged the kind of traffic that we brought to them. Uh, we are the only platform that provided entirely gen genuine results to them. In fact, this has led, led to an unprecedented action. Uh, the advertiser has almost changed their attribution model completely. Uh, the rule for them earlier was 24 hour, uh, you know, uh, disbursement post uh, validation, post registration. They are attributing, they, they are now attributing the user to, you know, like even seven days cycle. They're okay with that, yeah. So, again, you know, people like businesses used to wait uh, for automation before they reach scale. Uh, I speak to a lot of startups, I speak to a lot of SMEs, they want to, you know, right from the beginning, they know the kind of investment they're going to make, they want to have the right CDP in place, right automation tools, right, uh, you know, digital asset management tools into place before even they start scaling. So, you know, so, so I, you know, when, when, we, when we're talking about customer uh, data platforms, so, you know, 71% uh, you must believe that it will change the brand if the communication that's sent to them is more personalized. In fact, uh, so uh, brands that use CDPs have experienced 10 to 20% revenue boost also. Yeah? I think this is a constant battle for every marketer, uh, which is hyper-personalization versus data privacy. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, uh, you see customer wants, uh, you know, more personalization, uh, you know, like better, uh, you know, like a more sharper communication. And then at the, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, uh, the data protection laws are getting more stricter. There is GDPR, there is CCPA. Uh, and, you know, it will be a question for every marketer to answer how they strike a balance between, you know, uh, the hyper-personalization versus data privacy. Okay, so you can't read it, but I'll tell you. So this is voice and vernacular search. I can, this is another trend. Again, I can share from my own personal experience before even figuring out how to turn on the TV. My toddler daughter managed to say Alexa. So I think this uh, trend is going to be there. Uh, voice perhaps going, is going to be like the first, perhaps the, uh, the interface for a lot of new uh, joiners of internet in India. Yeah. So. That is something, uh, you know, that here is what is new from our side. I look forward to hear more from you. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the evening. And for the same, joining us up on stage is Mr. Gaurav Khatri, co-founder at Noise. Let's give a very warm welcome. He will be in conversation with Preeti Murthy, president at Group M Nexus. A very warm welcome to both of you. We all are really looking forward to this conversation. Over to you now. Thank you, Gaurav. It's a pleasure thanks, having thanks. you here. Uh, and I think that's the question I asked. I don't see you enough in events. You must do more. <laughs> so thank you for taking time out for this. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Preeti. And thanks, uh, Kit and uh, E.T. Yes. Thanks for having me here. Yes. So uh, before I start with my 2,000 list of questions that I put up for Gaurav, and I realized I just have 20 minutes. Uh, so we are going to make it smart and effective and keep it a little open-ended also, depending on what he says. Uh, the subject is what's next, right? But before we come to what's new and what's next for the industry, what I want to hear is how the idea of noise emerged and how did you build it up and what made it exciting? And we just spoke inside. That it's a 2,000 crore company, so you're not worried about the 100 crores anymore. What made it so large? I would like to uh, correct, first of all, I'm <laughs> always worried about the 100 crores because those 100 crores makes those 2,000. Uh, 
But yeah, I think uh, the journey started with a very different vision, honestly. Uh, to give you a quick contrast, I mean, uh, I come from a dear town city called Bikaner. Uh, have lived whole of my childhood there. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I would not call myself a Zen Z, but a millennial or, you know, someone who, who have lived into an era where there was no experiential brands in the cities or the town two or town three. And I always used to uh, wonder what makes us so different. I mean, what, what is the difficulty that as a country we have, why we don't have those brands, which globally we have so many. Uh, and I was pursuing as a commercial pilot. I was supposed to be a commercial pilot for my life, but uh, and now I feel fortunate that I didn't get into the career uh, in very detail. But yeah, I started this brand uh, called Noise with a vision of creating an experiential brand for the consumers. Uh, the idea was to give that right set of experience which we feel from the global brands. And I always felt that the Indian young consumer is looking for an aspirational values in what they purchase. Uh, we always very casually use the word that Indian consumer wants to buy cheap, but that's not real. Indian customer wants to buy a product which is aspirational, which has value attached to it. And that has, I mean, I had a very basic understanding of it and I wanted to uh, experiment it. I honestly didn't start the brand because I wanted to create a million dollar brand or something like that. But the idea was to create a brand which people can consume with love and feel proud of owning it. And that's when and we started it with a very small and clear vision that we had. So inspiring, I must say. Um, and I can relate to uh, some of that because I have a 20 year old niece now, but when she started college, we actually gifted her a, a, a noise right the watch and the uh, earbuds and she was very excited and she was flaunting it so it's a flaunt value today definitely for the consumer uh, but you know traditional marketing involves a lot of consumer insights and then you develop the product and then goes testing and obviously the world we live in is not that so how did you bridge the gap so fast see I would uh, not say it's fast it's been eight years now we are uh, running this brand uh, people are aware from last two three four years so there has been a decent journey that has gone behind it uh, like you said you know there's a traditional marketing there is a lot of understanding that one needs to do but uh, in my case it was very different because I was not an MBA grad I was doing my basic graduation and I was completely naive about starting anything new. For me, uh, starting this business was, you know, to give a try to thoughts that I have rather than what people feel and what the industry works at. So I did not have any background knowledge and probably that helped me in terms of trying in the way that I wanted and probably that was a way that was getting absorbed in the country and I think that Rahul also mentioned it's not about what you create, it's about also being at the right time, right place, and all the circumstances should behave in your favor. So I think a lot of this also, you know, fall into our way. Uh, we were very early brand who started e-commerce when the D2C world did not exist. It. Nobody used to believe the brands that exist as a D2C world. Everybody used to think that, you know, these are the sellers who sell on Amazon on Flipkart. Uh, why would somebody buy from your own website? Those challenges. Forget about the consumer. It used to be challenged from the partners and the ecosystem. But uh, it took some time and a uh, lot of D2C brand finally uh, post-COVID started seeing the results when consumer became very much aware about digital purchase and uh, had a lot of trust values in buying online and, and became a habit for them to you know, uh, start purchasing or transacting online. And, and I think that has been one of the reasons. I think when you're not aware about the traditional rules of starting something, it's yeah. sometimes easier to start blessing. with a new thought. Yeah, yes. it's a blessing. Yeah. Wonderful point, actually. Uh, because that's an interesting uh, deviation to the way you think or behave or do marketing. So what was, what was this shift you saw in the consumers in the last eight years? Because obviously from when you started to now, the behaviors have shifted a lot. A 20-year-old then is a 30-year-old almost, right? In the eight years. So there is a shift in the consumers you're targeting, whom are you talking to? What are the two, three levers you shifted then? See, uh, 10 years back, uh, when I was a consumer, I had very limited option to purchase. 
uh, whether it is respect to the brands, whether it is respect to the products, whether it is respect to the channel or platforms, right? A lot of things have changed, and uh, there is a lot of choices that consumer has. Uh, and each consumer is optimizing for something else, and you can't have one strategy that fit for all, all the users. And uh, I think I have learned in last six, eight years that you have to work with uh, a lot of data that you get by working for e-commerce, and it's not very expensive, right? Uh, versus a traditional media and an offline thing, when you work, you have to wait for the data, you have to wait for the time, you have to understand, analyze, and then make your strategy. But uh, when you're working online, the best part of working online is that you get the data real time, you understand what is happening, and you keep shifting your gaze according to the changes that you're seeing. So if you ask me what are the biggest changes, I would say the biggest changes with respect to, uh, of course, there has been great trust value that people have got, they have got into habit of purchase, they're believing the platforms more, they're ready to purchase directly from the D2C website, uh, now consumer are optimizing for the experience. They are very, very smart. Uh, they want to understand what is the difference between when I purchase from an e-commerce platform or a D2C website. So you have to work on that. Plus now there are a lot of other areas that has come in. You know, the quick commerce has come in. Now the people's want and go down deliveries is to be like 10 days, 10 minutes, sorry. 10 minutes. Right? We never wanted it. But when we got it, now we are not going back. Yeah. That's the consumer shift that we are seeing. and. Uh, experience and and I think the way e-commerce and the transactions are changing uh, is it's, it's irreversible behavior and it'll optimize for the next level next wonderful because uh, like you said the quick commerce is now changing the language of instant Maggie kind of a feeling right I want it though we know it's technically not two minutes but you know that perception has been built uh, and this is the new age consumer wanting us to do then and now but you also have built the brand very successfully. Many times brands that focus on the delivery sometimes misses uh, the journey on the brand. But you seem to have balanced that very well. And what made you bring that alive? You have a great brand ambassador. You have a great communication going. How do you blend that? I think there are a lot of things. Uh, there's no right formula to it. You have to have a balance in all the aspect, all the situation, all the departments of your business. Uh, I have been always one that who have not been optimizing for delivery, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. But there have been five or six levers that we always had in the brand that we would not compromise in the consumer experience, right? Uh, whether it is the design of the product, whether it's the delivery of the product, whether it is experience on your D2C, whether it is the packaging of your product, how beautifully or how greatly you are packaging it. One should feel that what you are trying to speak in your communication via the performance ads or the brand ads, the customer should get that. And you have to be very transparent in that. And I think we kept it very simple. I never wanted to complicate that, you know, keep optimizing for the delivery time, keep optimizing for packaging or design. You have to optimize what consumer is asking for. Mm -hmm. Don't optimize for everything. Mm -hmm. And keep your, uh, and you know, the business goals very, very close to you and understand how they align with the consumer. We kept it very simple, didn't want to deviate into too many things, and I think probably being focused has helped us in remaining where we are today. That's interesting because uh, critical pillar, focus, uh, understand the consumer, and don't spread too thin, right? So guys, there is a formula. <laughs> but at the same end, there's also a huge need of personalization, right? How are you addressing it via your channels or the consumer understanding, and how do you see it shaping the future? So in our case, uh, personalization is is not a very big factor of you know buying electronics and gadgets, right? There is some you know how would I say something that you need as a personalization, but what we feel in personalization is that uh, the data that you get from your D2C or the e-commerce platforms that what is that allowing a customer to take decision faster or converting your customer faster. You need to optimize those pillars or those levers faster. And sometimes it would be, you know, when you talk about the product specifically, there have been a lot of products that we have created by just understanding what consumer is searching for. For an example, when we launched our first calling watch, it was not an idea that came to us sitting in the office, right? When we started looking into the data, we understood, okay, there's a search of a lot of customers coming about, they need a calling smartwatch. 
we started building on that and we became that first watch to come in into that and we created a lot of our first products that came in the country for the first time ever based on the customer feedback by speaking to them one on one by doing all those customer sessions that we do normally in our office i think for us the customization is that uh, but yeah in an overall e-commerce e things you know you have to create a differentiated experience for every user that exists in the ecosystem for an example in our case we are what we are trying to do personalization is that there's a community of cyclists right we are trying to work with them giving them an extraordinary experience on our uh, app right that their community have all the you know points that they can discuss with the community people there for gym goers there's a separate community for uh, uh, uh you know someone who is optimizing for let's say health he is speaking on a different language so we are trying to build those community and create that experience and uh, you know the overall consumer centricity around that i think that's the personalization that we are trying to create in our category but yeah it's different for different category and businesses in tech, uh, you know, tech and tech products is always a new thing coming on board. And we have, like you said, you've communities built on various interests. Uh, health is a space that's so large and growing now. And with so many health rings and whatnot, I, it's, we're just short of putting chips in our body now, right? It's not very far off. Uh, what's your view on that? And where do you think noise is going to head there? See, our focus is very, very big on health overall. Uh, I can give all the gyan very easily that people are thinking and doing a lot about health. But today, they are aware about health as a word, right? Uh, everybody wants to be fit. Everybody wants to be aware about health. But are they using the products just for health? I would say not enough. The data is very small at this point of time. Uh, but yeah, the good part is that there is an awareness in overall ecosystem post-COVID. A lot of people are aware about what they need to do. So we put up in Gurgaon and understand that there's a lot of uh, peers around us are doing health. So we also optimize ourselves towards health and everything. But uh, the health is just at an awareness stage at this point of time. But yeah, it will be very, very big uh, because, like you said, a 20-year-old is now 30 year. The 20 year today is much more health aware about how we were in our 20s. So those will change a lot in the product tech in coming time and I think we are getting ourselves there and we are developing a lot of new tech gadgets. Well, you spoke about Ring, uh, we are already there with that. Uh, we are coming with a lot of other wearable devices that will help to you know optimize for your health and fitness. Interesting. And thanks for including me in your age group, which I'm not. My 20s, there were no gadgets. Someday, so you, someday you were. <laughs> I think my 20s mobiles were launched at 16 rupees or 32 rupees a minute, so uh, way long back. Uh, but jokes apart, I think that's a very important trend. I see two extremes of the consumer mindset. Either I'm like totally into the health and complete checks on co the, the weight of measurement of what I eat to the, uh, oh, am I having enough protein conversation? To the other end of, uh, if you go on Insta, Insta the younger generation into, uh, this food eating in this gully in Channi Chowk to whatnot, right? That, that's two ends of the spectrum. And hence, there is a growing trend of wanting to explore, travel, uh, do more with less time. Is there a product offering that you're exploring for consumers with that mindset or you're seeing that as an expansion route? See, uh, like I said, a lot of our products have been built based on the customer feedbacks and our one-on-one -on -one interaction with them. So there are truly wireless that we specifically created when we spoke to the fitness uh, cohort of our users and we understood, you know, they are the gym goers. They don't want uh, something that keep falling off from their ear. So they want something that can stuck to their ears and very easily and they can do it. We created that product. So it's very difficult for me to come in that, uh, you know, there is a lot of different uh, cohort of customers that will always be there and you have to keep optimizing. Yeah, there are a lot of things that we are doing, like we spoke about Smart Ring as a product. We are coming up with our first 4G watch that will allow a lot of customers to have. Our aim is to, you know, replicate the 65% of what we use in a smartphone should be controlled by a watch, right? So we're working in all the directions, uh, but yeah, a lot of these projects are secret ones, but yeah, you'll yeah, keep hearing a lot of it. Probe. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, we'll keep it a secret. We'll wait for the launch. Um, I'm just going to open up. I've got a note to open up questions because I have another 20, like I mentioned. But I'm going to open up the audience for some interesting questions for Gaurav. Yeah, the lady in the back and then the gentleman on the left. Hi, Gaurav. And first of all, congratulations for being the bootstrapped hero. And uh, my question is that when you're talking about a lot of communities that travel and hobbies, which are as niche as possible, we are wanting to reach out to people who have genuine interest in certain areas. And then we are talking about distribution platforms, async e-commerce, going as broad as possible so that the products actually reach the end consumers whom we are marketing. So as a marketer, what I sometimes feel is that while we are branding and marketing to the specific particular audience, but in terms of distribution, we want to be all over the place so that be it uh, boat, be it Samsung watches, noise should be there. How do we maintain that balance, uh, especially when we are actually crunched for money? See, honestly, this debate we keep on having in our marketing discussions also, where to optimize, where to create those campaigns specifically for a specific community or not. Uh, you know, you are in a journey at your brand at this point of time, specifically, let's talk about noise, where the country has not seen enough penetration in wearable at this point of time also, right? Uh, my personal take is that when a brand reaches to a certain area or a category reaches to a certain area where there is sufficient amount of people uh, for that specific niche community that you're talking about, that's when we start building those uh, campaigns which are targeting to a specific uh, audience or a cohort of customers. Uh, but but you can't let just campaigns go on a specific niche for a long duration also because category would be seeing the penetration for the masses at this point of time. So you have to look into the scenario of the market and the category and your brand, uh, you know, overall situation where it is at least this point of time. So it's, it's not a, I would not be able to comment on the what is the right balance, but it depends upon where is the brand, where is the category, where is the ecosystem of that specific uh, product that you are working on. And then post, post that, I think it's the time when you start working on the community. So a lot of sports brand globally, for an example, uh, let's talk about Nike as an example, right? They, they're optimizing for a sneaker separately, they're optimizing for a runner separately. Yes. So they have a scale where a niche piece also gives a substantial sales or revenue to the system. So I think it's, it's a time or the scale when the brand should do that. But yeah, parallelly you keep on doing it, uh, keep doing trials, you know, you never know what can work. I guess that's where the balance between p &L and marketing money is coming. Thank you. I agree. Hello, Gaurav. Uh, my name is Ashwini Dudeja. I'm from One Infiniting. So expertise into online and offline uh, branding. We do offline and online branding. My question is related to your product and other online products on e-commerce. So uh, because I'm one of the resellers of noise product also into B2B, corporate, corporate selling. So what I faced in D2C, you know, e-commerce, uh, shopping, even purchasing and selling both. That customer service, when you don't get the customer service, you get irritated as a customer, isn't it? But in AI, in, in, uh, in the AI scenario, where you don't happen to interact with the customer service executive directly in a chat form, in a physical chat form, manual chat form, or, or physical interaction with the customer. Then, then there's a hassle to sell a product or to buy a product. Are you getting my point? So I, I'm to say, how do you think that the physical customer interaction is mandate, whether it's on manual chat or one-on-one -on -one contact? See, uh, I have a very different take on this. Uh, I strongly believe that AI and uh, any form of artificial intelligence will help a lot of D2C or any other industry to operate and you know, uh, optimize their customer experience and the customer support side. It doesn't matter honestly because the consumer, I think uh, Rahul also mentioned somewhere, you know, people are not very much aware, the kids or the millennial or the Gen Z that we are talking about, they've got into a habit of not speaking to a human so often, right? They are pretty okay and accepting the behavior of a computer and so getting the solution from them. They want the leniency and, uh, you know, they don't want to 
वेट फॉर मेकिंग अ कॉल दैट यू नो सुबह नौ बजे से या चार बजे तक ही कस्टमर सपोर्ट चलेगा दे आर वॉन्टिंग टू एक्सप्लोर ऑल द टाइम्स वेन एवर दे आर फ्री दे जस्ट वॉन्ट टू टॉक एंड गेट द प्रॉब्लम एंड सोल्यूशन सॉर्टेड आउट इमीडिएटली सो आई थिंक इट्स इट्स इम्पॉर्टेंट इन सम कैटेगरीज वेर यू नीड अ ह्यूमन इंटरेक्शन वेरी वेरी ऑफन बट द वे इंडस्ट्री इज ग्रोइंग एंड द न्यू सर्विसेज एंड द प्रोडक्ट्स आर कमिंग आई थिंक इट विल बी ओके फॉर लॉर्ड ऑफ ब्रांड्स टू हैव कम्प्लीटली ए आई बिल्ड कस्टमर सपोर्ट इफ नॉट कम्प्लीटली एटलीस्ट एटी एटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ इट कैन बी सॉल्व राइट सो सब हाउ येस आई पर्सनली मीन इन आई पर्सनली फील दैट यू नो डिलाइट फुल कस्टमर सर्विस इज मैंडेट आई एग्री नो नो डिलाइट टू दैट फैक्ट you can't play within customer experience for sure exactly. irrespective of whatever it is because customer is the key for your sales absolutely thank you to both of you thanks thanks max thank you thank you for the wonderful questions and we are up on our time thank you gorav for setting thanks, the context thanks, making it exciting for the rest of the dis- discussions that are coming up uh wish you all the best in the new product line which is all suspense now and we look forward to hearing more of you in the prs now Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I you hope for the so. opportunity, Kitten. Thanks, guys. Let's give a big hand for Samrith Das Gupta, CMO. Heads up for tails. A very warm welcome to you, Samrith. Please have a seat at the dais. Please join me in welcoming Punit Chahar, Asia Head of Digital and Performance Marketing, OLX Group. A very warm welcome to you, Punit. Gopa Menon, Digital Head, Mindshare South Asia. Thank you so much for joining us Gopa please have a seat please put your hands together for Udit Malhotra head of marketing MG Motor India Hi Udit thank you so much for coming over please have a seat and let's welcome our moderator well who will be bringing out all the perspectives and driving this conversation forward Shavin Garg managing director and partner BCG a very warm welcome to you Shavin please be seated over to you now the topic is our beloved performance marketing uh i think around two decades ago the performance marketing came to existence with this concern which most advertisers had that we don't know where the money is being spent so we need to know whether this is generating value so we want to pay for outcomes you get the outcome we will pay you and that was the genesis of performance marketing uh two de- two decades now um and i work with a lot of my clients and a viewer we chatting on the side is this question really answered in performance marketing is it still giving you or is the question on roi on performance marketing known uh, does it solve that purpose how it has evolved is what we will talk about in this panel so thanks a lot for discussing this in advance uh, a lot of that discussion started when we were uh, planning for this session uh, in the in the speakers room but um let me get started um i think on this topic of performance marketing the first thing comes to is the measurement of a roi which is the genesis of this whole uh, element uh maybe if i can start with you and how do you think about measuring the performance is it the what the metrics are we all know about in this privacy first world Yeah. all the cookies not uh, uh not being the reason for attribution anymore how do you measure it and how do you see it moving so, forward i'm going to break this up in the most concise way i can one you have to be very clear about what is it that you wanted to measure when you ran the campaign yeah uh, i think a lot of us in hindsight and retrospect start to think about what needs to be measured and that has to change fundamentally uh second is we, uh, we are an omni channel brand which has three fronts we run an app we run a website and we run a retail front uh when you start to look at the attribution models across each of them uh the cookie pollution is not something that we are really worried about at this moment mm-hmm. because we are privileged to have a certain set of first party data but having said that for brands who don't have first party data the cookie challenge is a very deeply problematic challenge to solve for the way i would break it down is the following one be clear about the source of traffic that you want to get in because not all traffic is good traffic for you which hence means that you fundamentally need to be very clear about what kind of cookie pools do you really want to start remarketing to what do you want to nurture uh, what kind of content pools are you creating to make sure that that cookie uh, enablement is there um, second is try to find as much of a persistent cookie as you can as opposed to session cookies if that's possible in today's world 
And I think that is, right? So because there's a lot more login that's happening, people want longer content forms, so hence you're building deep funnels where people are moving through different kinds of interactions. Um, I think the maturity that is there now in the ecosystem as opposed to, and you started with the two decade back conversation, two decades back we were potentially all solving for Facebook likes and awkward pages. Yeah. A lot <laughs> has changed since then, right? And also what's changed, of course, is the consumer uh, himself and herself. I see a lot of younger folks coming in. Uh, they are cross device, uh, cross IPs, and you potentially can't just have a single unit of mapping. So again, you need that unique identifier, which for me is having a persistent session cookie that you can build through the entire funnel till we don't come to a cookie-less world where if you don't have the first party data, then you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So I'm gonna pause and I'll hand that over. No, uh, as you mentioned, I think the intelligence which is required for running the performance management campaigns well enough comes from many sources and those sources are expanding, right? Earlier it used to be the big platforms obviously the Googles and Metas of the world, but now the first party data, as you mentioned, needs uh, very important. But are there other places which you are seeing, maybe if I can ask you, uh, and if you are thinking about improving the efficiency of your marketing campaigns around performance, how are you adding more insights, more uh, value to them than before? See, I think, um, and what we've observed, so firstly, MG has just been four years into the country, so one advantage, one distinct advantage MG has is we've built everything from scratch. So, uh, you know, when, we, when you were talking about measurement, uh, I was, and we discussed this, you know, it is garbage in, garbage out. So, uh, the benefit that MG has is, one, whatever is our audience data, whatever we've acquired over the last four, four and a half years, whether through leads, inquiries, bookings, uh, you know, we've acquired them bottom up and the system is clean. So the fundamental here is when we are working on the measurement of a campaign, for us, we are actually revolving around a lot of closed ecosystems even till now. The dependency on volume of inquiries, which is Facebook leads, Instagram, Google, is still predominant. But what we've been doing with a lot of players, including smaller ecosystem players, is working on a pure play cost per sale model, mm -hmm. uh, where the cohort data, LTV value of the customers, and audience insights are predetermined, and we are getting an assured result. So one is four years of data, which we've learned, where there is some amount of predictive analysis telling that I will get these many bookings in a month, this will be my cost per booking, this will be my cost per retail, but the other platforms that are there are the smaller ones who are ready to work with a lesser amount of pool, but they would guarantee you results. But majority, 80% still relies on these wall garden ecosystems. Uh, and the last concluding part is that when we started our journey, we were very heavy on MarTech. Uh, and we anyways, yeah, you know, present ourselves as an autotech brand. So in the MarTech curve, we. Uh, you know, we onboarded the entire Adobe stack for a full, full funnel perspective. So from the time you're coming on to the website till the time you are becoming an identified user in the ecosystem, we are mapping that entire journey. So that holistic analysis also has helped us from being unidentified to identified to let's say a prospect or a booking or a sale in the ecosystem. So those are some of the efficiencies that we're trying yeah. to work on. No, uh, and if I could ask from a from a agency perspective now, the performance marketing as it has been evolved over, and we talked about first party data, we talked about using different smaller platforms which have higher quality outputs. How are you seeing it from your side and across brands, across category of brands, how it has evolved? So I think uh, I think both of uh, actually. Uh, talked in detail in terms of how they have seen and I think we've seen and I think it is uh, kind of uniform across what we're seeing from client uh, one definitely is the importance of performance marketing second is obviously looking at the data uh, so the importance of first date, first party data is again coming through we are having increasing conversation in terms of how we are able to actually bring 
sanctity to data, can we create CDPs, or talking about data leaks as well. So that's the kind of conversation that most of the clients are now getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part is from a measurement perspective, uh, we definitely, I think, uh, uh, different uh, multi-touch uh, studies or multi-attribution studies, cross-channel studies, are now being actually being asked or rendered uh, or being deployed for us to actually get to know whether uh, performance is working, not working, what is the measurement objective, what should we be actually measuring as well. You started off uh, stating that are we measuring the right thing as well. Uh, I think again, when we start off with the right objective and we are measuring it through the funnel, I think that works. Okay. Great. And I think as we keep talking about performance marketing, it's almost as an, it's an antithesis to brand marketing. Um, and these days if you think of performance marketing uh, only as a lower funnel generation engine and not thinking of brand in that same context. It is something which has been, a, I mean, at least in my client conversations, it has been a diverse view uh, of people thinking of two different funnels. One is a brand marketing, I'll spend mass market um, or even digital, uh, but then there is this performance marketing. Maybe if I can ask your opinion, how are you seeing that? Are they different? Are the lines are blurring between the two? How do you see that? So like you uh, uh, started you know, in your uh, opening remark, two decades back, that was not the problem. <laughs> so how performance marketing started, uh, you know, there was growing concern of understanding how your marketing investment is performing. Uh, hence, the performance marketing came into the picture where you can measure the incremental business uh, through profitable and measurable channels. Mm. Till here it was fine. But then more and more channels you know, came into the picture. Okay. And hence it became you know, complicated. Because you not only have more channels, then you have more screens as well. Correct. Uh, not all the channels will behave same. They have their own, you know, uh, pros and cons. Uh, like there are uh, pull channels, there are post channels, and you need different strategy and different ways, you know, to measure the performance as well. Hmm. When generally, you know, how people define, uh, you know, performance, maybe it is somewhere mid to bottom funnel. Uh, they are all already audience in the, you know, that category, and you are just converting those audiences. Hmm. However. Uh, if I give this example, there is like you have the tap, uh, you know, that is your performance marketing. But you will get the water only till, you know, uh, there is water in the tank. Now to fill that tank, you need to make investment at the top of the funnel. Now the question is, now because there is enhanced, you know, focus on frugality, uh, because the the growth at any cost is not the norm anymore. Hence, there are questions about how my brand marketing investment is performing. Mm. And there are growing, you know, uh, concerns about, okay, maybe earlier, you know, uh, it was like, okay, we will make the spend now and we will have, you know, the ground brand, you know, grown in next two years, this and that. That is not, you know, uh, acceptable now. Yeah. Digital has evolved a lot in terms of measurements. And when it comes to, you know, digital side of top of the funnel, you know, investment, there are means and ways, you know, to measure what is the impact of your brand, you know, focused investment on overall conversion, but also on your performance marketing as well. We did, you know, this exercise internally when we did, uh, you know, our first TV plus digital brand campaign and we measured the performance and its impact on performance marketing. Mm. And from those learnings, then we pivoted more towards you know, digital. Because it was making sense for us. We have presence in some 10, 12 cities where the business, most of the business is coming from. Hence, it does not make sense for us to go pan India you know, using Correct. our TV. So for different brand, at what stage the brand is, the media mix will be very different. You yeah. want to create and grow the category, or you just want to convert the people who are already there in the category. Yeah, and you talked about complexity, which did not exist earlier, but now exists. And I wanted because your brand actually has complexity of both the online, offline. Uh, there is retail stores. There are people who are walked. Uh, there is marketplaces. 
all of these complexities and consumer has all these intertwined uh, like they will watch it on instagram but chat on a whatsapp get influenced by somebody on instagram but visit a store how do you is it really complex in your mind if you have all the data or do you feel that it is just about how do you look at it just the way you said it it seemed really complicated <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a genesis yeah. of that <clears throat> no it's it, it's complicated it's complicated because of couple of reasons um and this is nothing to do with marketing or the growth side of it or how you're spending media or whatever it is right one my customer and my consumer are completely different so hence there is a reflection of what the consumer is feeling consumer is going through and then that gets manifested into how cons- customers are choosing right so it's a it's a double layer challenge for a business like ours second is we are because we are very rich with the first party and i'm sorry i'm coming back to that point but it adds to complexity also it's not that it makes life extremely easy uh-huh. people expect us to be able to deliver more personalized experiences so if you don't have that then that's okay but as a par for the course you potentially have my data you know where i'm shopping how i'm shopping what is my behavior you know everything about my dog or my cat how can you not give me something that is deeply personalized deeply meaningful how can you show me ads that you know are not relevant to me how can you remarket to me uh, if i have if i have a cat and you remarket it to me with a dog product then there's fundamentally something wrong with you uh, if i am if i have a female dog and you showing me a male dog then there's something wrong with you the expectations of people over a period of time has become extremely difficult to handle so potentially that's another challenge that brands will need to look at when they start to look at cross attribution and sort of cross content being created which will be deeply personalized so that's one problem second is to your larger question that how do we make sure that there is a standardization of attribution across all these channels the identifier has to be one yeah you know and i think a lot of businesses spend a lot of time effort money bandwidth on getting a lot of consumer data the usable part of that consumer data is potentially only a sliver of what you've got so first solve for that so if you know what your unique identifier is going to be throughout your customer journey then solve for that make sure that there is as much authenticity validation of that one unique identifier which in our case is a phone number so let's assume that if i never do an otp verification of that phone number i will have a bunch of data which is completely wrong right but you know so it's mentioned right garbage and garbage out i have to remove that from the system so for us to potentially start removing that from the system we have to rely on some degree of a validation layer some degree of an authenticity layer so that we know that that unique identifier which cross walks across uh, an app to a website to the retail where we have both product and we have service how do i make sure that you map through the ecosystem yeah. right so that unique identifier is it's fundamentally critical got it and no conversation in this age and world is complete without talking about artificial intelligence and if i could add generative uh, artificial intelligence i wanted to get opinion actually from two different the marketer side and the agency side on this and that itself is a spectrum there is ai in a box kind of solutions which are all these platforms have give us give us the data give us the money we will optimize on its own ai in a box versus all of these solutions which are pocket solutions where you are optimizing for whether it is content personalization whether it is about identifying the digital twin etc where do you see value right if you were to put your bet on it uh, it will evolve as it evolves but if i was to ask your opinion where are you putting what's your bet on what will succeed uh, or how will it change the how you perform uh, do performance marketing uh because of this new tools or machine learning abilities uh of ai so maybe if i could ask yours first and then uh your opinion on this please so i'll answer this in two parts <clears throat> specifically for brands one is the buzzword on gen ai where people are using mid journey leonardo dot ai and the likes yeah. so one is the performance part which you asked but i think the first set where performance is getting enabled and when we talked about is brand essential or performance i think both are hand in glove so here the first part is how is gen ai solving for creative needs of a performance marketing campaign and there are a lot of products in the ecosystem where if you're running a facebook campaign or any other kind of campaign 
they are dynamically changing the AI. Maybe let's say taking A-B test to a next level, doing real-time suppression of the creative, so on and so forth, where it is solving for calling an agency saying, I need this creative right now. Maybe it's dynamic text, maybe it's you know dynamically changing the background and whatnot. Yeah. Now, AI has always been there when it came to all these big platforms or the wall garden platforms, whether it's search, whether it's social, and that's the reason we used to heavily rely on that intent data. One conclusive point, at least that I have arrived at, and this is my personal opinion, <clears throat> AI can only give you directional intelligence. It can help you enable directional intelligence and after that you need human intervention to solve for the complete puzzle. So for my enablement, for my knowledge enrichment and let's say 20-25% efficiency at this stage in today's era, it may be you know, solving that amount of problem. The third use case even for AI ML which I am seeing to you know, evolve really fast is uh, AI and automation at hyper local level. So we discussed briefly pr prior to our uh, you know, <coughs> panel where we used to run hyper local, it's still being run by people at pin code level, at outlet level, generating calls, generating ads. But as you are seeing there are more and more platforms that are saying that okay, let my layer of AI sit on the top, learn it from your business manager, learn it from your Google's ad account and let us run the campaign. So it's a trial and error approach, but there are emerging platforms at least in auto where hyperlocal inquiry generation is doing really, really well. But the same products are not working in certain other categories or even in certain markets. So for example, North may be a very big market where my hyperlocal AI campaign is scaling up. Vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say South has a market where it's not able to scale up. Now the reason can be, let's say, regional language, ability to understand nuances, ability to decode the you know Gen AI capabilities or the AI capabilities that are there for, let's say, regional languages. So it's partly solving, still evolving, uh, but we are definitely doing some pilots in this area uh, for trial and error as well. Okay. Uh, so as I heard it, it's AI always existed. These are some fancy tools which will add a few percentage efficiency, but it will always need human direction and it can only give you, I like your statement you said, it will only give you a directional input. That's your view. Okay. How do you... So coming from an agency where I think... Uh, Humans are, uh, we can't actually throw humans for each and every problem in that sense, right? And we are always uh, struggling for that headcount or that particular piece. I think uh, AI is a good addition and I agree to this in, in that sense, uh, stating that will always been there, be it in Google and Meta. But now you have uh, different uh, products which are available, which you can use. As from an agency or a client perspective, what we've been seeing is that we have been using AI right from inside generation, to bid optimization, to light, uh, to r if you want to actually do creative optimization at scale, creation of creatives as well. All of this is happening and you are able to do this at scale. Time is actually being reduced with half the human effort that is required. Is it still there? I don't think so. Has it reached that potential? No. But I think it will eventually get there as we are actually growing and learning in that sense. But obviously, again, agreeing to this, uh, it can't be... Uh, 100% AI, it has to have a human layer always. Uh, otherwise, obviously, we have seen and we have seen multiple examples, uh, cases uh, within our uh, ecosystem as well where things have gone uh, down south in that sense, right? But definitely an enabler. Uh, it gives a very good directional uh, inputs. We are able to do use that and try and see how we are able to scale up. Right, either again, as I said, right, if you're optimizing for CAC, if you are actually optimizing for better creative, if you want to do UAT testing, AB, AB testing, anything possible, I think AI is able to do it in Jiffy, which you could have t uh, would have taken. For example, if you want to do a research, you would have to actually call a research agency and get it done. Now it is happening in Jiffy at a fraction of cost. So in that sense, it's a very handy tool to have, but it will evolve as we move. If you were to put a number on uh, it's working, what's 
not. Um, if you were to put a number on, as you said, efficiency, both of you would, um, and this has been the hottest debate in town, right? Content creation can be done in Jiffy. The A-B testing can be done in Jiffy, which used to take a lot of time. Research agencies used to take a lot of time. Um, and iterations on these, which used to be like, not just even effort-wise, but the time it takes to take a campaign live used to take a lot of time, which will get faster. Um, if you were to put a number on if total was 100 as an agency effort today, with AI, maybe six months or a year down the line, how much of that effort will come down? If you were to guess a number, what would that be? Again, depends on the kind of work that we're talking, trying to talk, actually. And if everything is standardized and data being great, all of that being actually in, uh, in that proper format, I think we'll be able to reduce roughly around 40% of Okay, 40%. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> so can yes, I just please. add my perspective to it? Uh, so I have very simple, you know, uh, method of, you know, understanding this. So if we put, uh, you know, machines and humans on two by two matrix, uh, so you have humans interacting with humans, or say humans selling to humans, then you have machines selling to humans, then humans selling to machine, and machine selling to machine. So machine selling to machine is the extreme example. That is like the end game. Uh, ultimately, it will end there. Uh, l let me give, give you one example of that. Uh, how many of you buy or search or explore any tool in the market for your needs? Now, today you do it yourself, or someone from your team does it. They talk to a you know, couple of folks in the market, analyze, also analyze what are your needs, and if there is a match, then you you know go into deeper discussion and finally buy that tool. Now the same thing can be done with the machine, with AI. And on the other hand also, the machine will be se selling to you, where the machine will be helping you with, with your queries. Okay, what is the tool that best you know fits to, to my needs? Mm. So that is an extreme example. Now let's come to the, the lowest hanging fruits, where humans are selling to humans. Your contact center for example, sales agent. Now, I'm not talking about replacing them. It is about aiding them, augmenting them with the right insight. Mm. That is the low hanging fruit. Second would be the machine to human, where machines are selling to human. Go to any e-commerce site, that is a machine. The machine is selling to you. That is next low hanging fruit. You can recommend, you can personalize, you can do a lot many things you know, in that area. After that, maybe, you know, where uh, other, you know, things into machine versus machine is happening, you know, those are the areas. One more dimension to it I would like to add, since we talked about automation. Today, I think most of the AI uh, is exploratory. Because we are in wow. Uh, the general audience is in, in wow because they have experienced AI for the first time and chat, chat GPT, image journey, all them, you know, made it possible, okay, here is AI, experience it. Mm -hmm. So it is more of a wow factor. Also at the same time, because the management is asking question, what are you doing on AI? It is a FOMO as well. <laughs> yeah? So it is FOMO as well. Now, whether you have thought through of your use cases, where it is going to help your business, and if we add automation layer to it, we are talking about creating content. But if you create that content with automation, then who is going to check that for your, your brand tonality, yep. your experience, it is not there. So for experience exploration, it is good. But when it comes to you know doing it at scale, long way to go. Thank you. So it's it's a wow factor. It is something which can enhance the experience. Yes, efficiency is still there, but not yet fully trustworthy to leave it alone. And I think we were talking on the back. You started by saying, I don't trust AI, okay. period. No, I don't. Uh, so why do you want to elaborate? Go, go, go. Yes, sorry, just, just let me add you know, one experience because we were having a discussion with someone. We believe that AI cannot be manipulated. It can be. There are folks working on manipulating it 
I know folks personally. <laughs> I know brands personally who have deployed hundreds of folks in India to manipulate what the AI is talking about their brand. So it is to that level. It is happening. Some yeah, of yeah. the people I'm are sure doing it. I'm sure there will be next layers of exactly. uh, gaming the systems. But why don't you trust AI, Samrith? I think a bunch of reasons here. One, uh, the, and let's remove trust as a word here. I don't think I can depend on AI, right? And I can depend on something once I start to really see meaning and value in it. I think that a couple of things. One, the Indian consumer set is extremely complicated. And AI has fundamentally been built on the back of a Western view, which, and I, I don't mean in a flippant manner, I generally mean that the engineering of it has fundamentally happened, looking at prompts which are English first, uh, right spellings, right grammar, right syntax, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, the data sets that have been fed to AI throughout historically are all English. Uh, very few data sets are in Indic language. Um, and potentially now we are looking at about 60-70% of search that's happening in India, whether it's products or services, happening in Indic languages, they're happening through voice. Uh, interfaces are now being multilingual. Uh, a lot of communication that is going out from the brand to the end consumer needs to be in different dialects and different contexts. I don't think AI has matured to a point where it's able to look at all these variables. And India is a land of variables, right? So we essentially change between kilometer to a kilometer. Uh, and it's not age group dependent. It's not potentially even your earning capacity dependent, which is what are the determinants of a lot of things when, it look, when the West starts to look at consumer sets. Our consumer set dynamic and the diversity of it and the variability of it. I don't think AI has matured to a point where we can start <coughs> To even imagine <clears throat> that's able to read all the indicators and really start to take those decisions. Mm -hmm. So the indicators that AI will get right now are so deeply complex, especially in an ecosystem that is being built, that uh, that maturity of deciphering what that input really means and what is the next possible direction, whether it's a direction or action, which is scary, yeah. um, that the AI engine needs to take, I don't think it's matured to that. So it's not about trust, it's the fact that I don't think it's I can It's not matured it. yet. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's good. And I, I wanted to keep a uh, last five minutes for audience questions, but I'll just summarize what we just discussed. Performance marketing is obviously has been there and is here to stay. Uh, in the world of frugality, where all brands are thinking about how can I get my next set of growth with spending minimal amount of money, the uh, the pressure or uh, performance pressure on performance marketing is here to stay. Um, and I think what we discussed is that the lines of performance marketing versus brand marketing have already blurred, if not uh, if was always blurred. Uh, but the element of long-term thinking of brands and building like a two-year, three-year view is not the current, what we discussed is not the current game. It is about where can you get here and now, but which can be done through brand and performance marketing both. We discussed how Gen AI uh, and AI as a topic has different perspectives, but one thing very consistent is the AI will definitely add a very insightful direction or uh, input into make, making better decisions. And the decisions on how to spend, uh, what is the consumer behaviors which used to take time. And second, it will probably add efficiency of anywhere between 25, you said, and 40, and take your pick um, in terms of not just effort in terms of cost and we clarified it is also about uh, efficiency in terms of accuracy of uh, iterations of coming fast about saving time uh, in campaign which used to take months or weeks to make could be in days or hours or minutes I think those are efficiencies which are very real and the maturity of AI for Indian language Indian context is yet to evolve but it's, it's probably on its way. But that's what we discussed, and I would ask if any audience has any question for the panel on the performance marketing topic. Since we have uh, two minutes, so let me add one more. Uh, yeah, sure, Just, please. You know, uh, when we talk about AI, it is not limited to Jan AI. Yeah. Because most of uh, the discussions these days are focused on generative AI, because that, that is what people have experienced. Uh, for every organization, uh, pricing is one of the key metrics, uh, you know, in order to, you know, uh, get you just converted. 
and that is you know one of the areas you know where ai is being used extensively but because we cannot experience it hence we do not know whether it is there or not yeah so i think ai is beyond uh, uh, gen ai and those are the use cases and you know those are the 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 beyond gen ai that is going to help businesses yeah no the fair point to add um, and i think one of the elements which we also discussed and i think that was very profound is that uh, performance marketing is all about measurement and the measurement the dynamics of that has changed um without first party data without the knowledge about a singular version of your customer the power of performance marketing in a cookieless world will become already challenged and will become even more challenged uh the data privacy laws which have just been enacted in india and they will evolve with time uh how well will you be able to track the customer on their behavior on their actions is also under question so it is a very highly dynamic environment of performance marketing and how the agencies and the brands will think about it and how consultants will help them um is something which is um what will be the time will tell but it's a very important topic a lot of money getting spent for getting the growth uh and uh how will it evolve is something which we will have to work with so thank you panel absolutely because see uh, going forward uh consented identity is going to be the currency it is not just the identity yeah it is with consent as well correct because with the with this bill now you need to work on the consent part as well that so can be a challenging for many other the brands future. if they have not thought it about it already and for agencies and for even platforms like the ones which we have been used to using so that will be a massive change and we are already discussing with a bunch of our clients around what is it means for them how what practices will they still can continue with not continue with and the point around consent and data storage data where do you store it how long can you use it for uh etc the all of these are very important questions which will need to be answered but thank you thank you everyone for your deep insights hope it was insightful for the team as well a big thanks to all the panelists for sharing their valuable insights on the future of performance marketing and very beautifully emphasizing the fact that how we need to maintain a balance between the ai and human direction So thank you so much for some really thought provoking insights. So with this ladies and gentlemen uh, without any further ado moving forward and uh, next up we have a session lined up for the same I would now like to invite on stage Alexey Archinov Google Lead GTech EMEA Emerging Markets a very warm welcome to you Alexey over to you Hello everybody um um first of all and foremost um uh, thank you for inviting me Uh I work for Google. I'm uh, leading the uh, Google technical consultants in emerging markets. And uh you can thank uh, uh my daughter, my little Sophie, for the pink shirt I wear in today. I I I was planning for the white one, but it didn't work because she has a beautiful uh pink flower. So uh um I'm a bit nervous because it's the first time I actually present something in front of my daughter and I'm at the same time very very proud. <laughs> thank you very very much. So privacy a, a very very important thing which uh evolved uh over the last years it's uh, not something new okay yeah it's not something new it has been here for a couple of years but um uh it has started with just a fuzzy word with something which is like fancy it's uh, something which we just said okay let's play with this Let's go with the programmatic. Let's just play with the data. Where we get this uh, uh, data from, and yada yada yada, and it actually evolved into the uh, quite a challenge for the publishers, ad blockers. Think about it, right? I mean, it's, uh, those the uh, technology which actually appeared because the privacy got you know some sort of the important part, and the users get scared a bit. They would like to actually see less ads. That it turned into the next step. Now um these days the privacy is less of the just the technical thing it's more of the actual economical thing which affects the bottom line of the marketing budgets of the marketing investments the ROI so you cannot just you know just have it just in, in a nice way 
mentioned in the conferences, this is actually a very business thing. Um, and the, uh, the two sections which I would like to cover and distinguish is that the, actually the privacy today is something is very relevant, if not the same thing as the performance. Because the privacy cannot be without the performance, and now these days performance cannot be without the privacy. So let's discuss today the power durable performance, how to power it, and what are the actual steps toward. I would try to keep my 15 minutes, which is even less now, on the level above the details, and the, uh, if needed, I will, can just jump in on the uh, offline and they probably touch upon those uh, particular things. Uh, now, bear with me. I will try to figure out. Okay, so um, what's important uh, uh, about this is that the uh, uh, Google recognize where the whole industry is going. And a bunch of the solutions which are coming out uh, in the way of the features of the products or the solutions as a uh, standalone solutions, having this uh, uh, privacy-centric approach in the center of it. And the, uh, uh, discussing that, uh, the, probably the major part of this is that dilemma. Dilemma of that people, and I, uh, based on the uh, uh, quite uh, uh, known BCG analysis, 74% of the users, they simply reject to see non-relevant ads. They don't want to spend time. They don't want to be clocked with those uh, banners or videos which has no relevance. They don't want to waste time. Uh, yet, on the other side, pretty much the same portion of us, 80%, now being concerned how the data is being used. And you get in those two things, same people saying, oh, we need data because otherwise how would I see the actually important uh, ads. On the other side, oh, I don't want to share my data. So that kind of thing, which we, I mean, the uh, really uh, trends which uh, we are uh, living in. Um, so those two things are driving the uh, two key elements of the ecosystem, the regulatory and the technology. So those two things particularly drive the regulations and all the GDPR and all other acts, and actually the, uh, this aches which hanging over there, trying to punish everybody who is trying to abuse user data. On the other hand, we have a technology. And the technology is pretty much in the same situation, and we think that the technology causes some issues. But as a matter of fact, the technology just follows a trend. So all those things which, uh, uh, which we see is, uh, uh, is just the actually blocking user level uh, uh, traction. Or, the building alternative ID solutions. We're trying to build the uh, environment where the partners or data partners can safely exchange the data and they actually uh, uh, enhance the data of each other. And then lastly, build the privacy preserving solutions. This is all a part of this big thing of the privacy and how to respect the user yet to make the campaigns effective and the performance be performance, after all. Um, speaking of which, um, Google is actually investing quite a lot. And let me just give you a couple examples where Google is developing the uh, 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 solutions uh, with the uh, privacy-centric approach. A uh, couple of years ago, we probably heard about the ADH, or Ads Data Hub where the Google actually uh, build the system where the uh, uh, clients, partners of Google, Google itself, can contribute the data without compromising each and everybody's uh, uh, PII or the personal data. This is the system where the, uh, uh, you can actually derive the quite different uh, 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 insights out of the campaigns and then activate those insights of the Google products. Now, these days, we're definitely talking about the further developments, and the, uh, uh, Google is launching the AI solutions. The a very interesting panel. Thank you very much for the participants. Uh, I was, 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 was really excited to, to, to hear about this. Uh, the solutions which actually help not only automate the processes, but actually find the trends 
of how users behave and out of those trends build the proper solutions on top of that. So those solutions uh, are built into the products. They've been launched this year. There was a, uh, quite a big announcement of those and uh, I'll be happy to share that uh, afterwards on the, uh, uh, on the margins of this uh, summit. Now, the, um, uh, what's important about this is the uh, Google is obviously has a lot of data. This is no secret about it. I mean, you, you cannot deny it. Seven billion people overall between different products of Google, this is something which, which you cannot hide. However, respecting the user is very, very important. So building the uh, uh, mechanisms, how the users can actually delete their data or wipe their data, making sure that the data cannot be leaked or used uh, on a personalized uh, uh, way. That's what the Google is really investing in. And the, uh, um, um, just lost my mind. Okay, so, so the, uh, the, 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 the important part of this is the uh, uh, making sure that the data is reusable for the performance campaigns. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's what to do. Now let's take a look at the, good, all right. So let's take a look at the actually, what are the key actions? Because this is quite important. So, so we know respecting the data, respecting the users, this is only buzzy words, but the, what actually we are discussing here, what are we talking about? So the, uh, um, there are three, major topics or major pillars that Google uh, chooses uh, when he's trying to, uh, I would say, categorize the, uh, the, the efforts around the data and the privacy. So first of all is to build. So build more meaningful custom relationships. That means that the user, whoever used these marketing messages, have to be engaged. He has to get the message or the communication or the creator which actually relates to him. And by him or her, I mean in the right moment, in the right way, on the right format. So all that has to be matched and that cannot be without data. That's, that's clearly so. Right now measure a very interesting part. As the whole digital marketing become more and more complicated, to say the least, comprehensive, it actually gets more and more different uh, marketing channels I into the campaigns. That all becomes very important. How you not just measure the campaign itself, but how you actually trace the user from the moment that you actually engage him. When you actually born an interest in your product or solution into actual sale, and how after the sale you prevent the churn how you make sure that the actually client experience would be proper, uh, uh, proper. And on top of that, you're using the branding to make sure that the uh, user understands what your brand is about. And then the whole thing returns and the and, 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 uh, wills uh, keep rotating. And now the insights. So you measure the campaign. So you know pretty much how users travel from A to Z. But now how would you drive the insights. What do you do next? What kind of audiences you would like to engage? And again, remember, you cannot follow the same person online just because this is a privacy issue. This is, I mean, you, can, you don't want to follow him. You don't want to stalk him. So, but how would you actually build the proper behavior of your campaigns, engaging more people, yet making sure that the performance is there? So this is the pillars, and this is how Google looks at the, uh, at the solutions and they build the narrative around it uh, uh, um, uh, there. Now, we just discussed that the performance would be consistent of the first party data infrastructure, very important, how you collect the data, where do you store it, how would you actually match the data between the different data points between each other, that's very, very important. Now, how you feed this data into the different AIs. Would it be just automation? Or would it be the DGN AIs, which we just discussed in the AI in the previous sections? And then privacy preserving. How you make sure that the, every user has a right uh, and ability to erase the data from the systems, whichever systems we're discussing here. So if you take these metrics, I don't want to read this slide, that's not about it. Uh, those are the things which you can actually do and the solution which you can use from Google uh, uh, to figure out your plan. Now that's not about it, it's not only about it, but now if you activate, measure, and build, 
and now you have your own objectives, your business objectives, the metrics would become even more complicated. I would probably take another 15 minutes just to get, you know, read the first column. Really, really complicated. It's just, it's not a buzzword. The measurement and the privacy had become a very complicated, comprehensive thing by itself, which stitched together so many different things. It's not just search. It's not just video, it's just the display, it's not the social media, it's all together, it's digital out of home. I mean, so many different things come together and the measurement and the privacy becomes the core and the, uh, and the, and the glue of the whole uh, marketing uh, activity these days. Now, uh, it's a very interesting thing which is very dear to my heart, uh, quite honestly, I'm working on that because the uh, maturity or measurement maturity had become a very hot topic these days. So how would you actually travel from the point when you just simply Google tag or put in the tags on your, on your, on your uh, digital assets into the moment and you actually can predict uh, uh, and, and build predictive model? I mean, there's a path in here and you cannot just simply jump from one point to another without making so many different things in between. Without, and that's the key message, changing your business, changing your product. You, you, you cannot actually expect that the, all of a sudden the data would be just uh, working for you. It just, it's, it's more. You have to make a lot of changes inside your organization to make sure that you measure the proper things inside, that not only you measure, you store it properly, you respect the user, you use those signals to activate your campaigns, so many different things. And this is all the Google solutions which we actually uh, put on this map to introduce you uh, uh, into this uh, uh, maturity uh, framework. Now, uh, with that, I would probably uh, present you like a three a simple steps. Simple is definitely a joke, uh, a way of uh, uh, playing with the audience. It's that they're not sometimes simple and they're not sometimes cheap, but yet uh, uh, very, very important. And I think I love the expression I saw, uh, I heard from the uh, uh, very first uh, speaker here. Uh, you, you, if you would not invest in this, if you would not take this seriously, you're definitely going to miss the bus. And you're going to miss the bus not only in India, but you know, anywhere at all. So, so this is the really a key message of mine today. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you. And Let's invite our panelists on the stage. Please join me in welcoming Sukleen Aneja, CEO, Good Brands Company, the Good Glam Group. A very warm welcome to you, Sukleen. Samir Sethi, VP and Head of Brand Marketing, Policy Bazaar. Dima Raketa, CEO, Reputation House. And the moderator for the session, Ms. Shweta Mulki, Consulting Editor, The Economic Times. A very warm welcome to all of you. Over to Shweta. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of you may not have created content, but what about buying from influencers? How many of you have been just influenced by influencers to buy things? Hands up? Any hands up? Oh, we are kind of, uh, are we in the wrong generation right now? <laughs> But uh, I'm sure you know about this space and you're curious to know where it's going to go. So um, a big welcome to my panelists here. Uh, in this session, we're going to delve into the factors uh, behind the speedy but steady growth of influencer marketing. Uh, and it has sort of been anointed as a trusted voice, you know, with the, and credited with higher engagement rates, conversions, and improved brand sentiment. A lot of good things being said about it, basically. And we want to know whether that's all really true, whether there's a lot of depth in that, and uh, how do we leverage this uh, power? It's an industry that's said to be touching 2200 crores INR by 2025. I mean, I know these are numbers, but they seem like it's kind of poised for some rapid and major growth. So let me just start off with this uh, kind of a headline assessment of where it is today. Uh, how is it influence, how, how is influencer marketing kind of uh, having this impact on the new consumer today? What's your assessment of it? A quick one. So I think for most of us who come from the new age brands or if we look at traditional brands, I don't think anyone in the room can actually say that we've not seen influencer marketing as part of your marketing mix. 
So the biggest change I see is that in your 360 today, I think 100% of the brands will have a role for influencers, whether it's luxury marketing, it's SMEs, or it is mass marketing. So clearly there is a room for advocacy. That's one huge change that's happened. I think the second thing which is also a remarkable change that we've all seen, and especially all those of us who've been working for a while, look at how large the creator economy is. Sometimes I feel every third person is a creator. You know, because you go to a restaurant, people are taking pictures of their food. So everyone in their own circle is trying to influence somebody. And there are these circles of influence, whether they are micro influencing circles or whether you're a large macro which is trying to make a large impact. But I think everybody has deep interest communities that they are building based on who they are. So I think creator economy has given a lot of common people a voice. And that voice, I think, is really making a big impact in marketing. Yeah, quite true. So I think uh, till about five years ago, we used to hear about influencer marketing as this up and coming marketing channel, right? Uh, which can contribute just that tiny bit of incremental uh, revenue or transactions. Yeah. Experiments, they were called. Sorry? Experiments, they yeah, were called. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, from up and coming, uh, especially post COVID, the share of uh, influencer-driven uh, business value has become quite meaningful for a lot of brands. It is not just something to experiment with, like you said. I'm even aware of uh, some brands uh, in, in certain impulse categories where the primary uh, source of customers is in some form uh, influencer marketing. And uh, even for our category, which is very high involvement, slightly complicated to understand, takes a bit of time for a person to research and uh, come to a decision of what to buy, where to buy from and all of that. Even in my category, it is uh, becoming increasingly meaningful, uh, even at a ticket size of 20, 25K and above, mm -hmm. which tells you about the trust that people lay in a lot of these creators, like Sukleen was saying. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, influencer marketing has arrived. The debate uh, now no longer is, okay, will it work, will it not work? It's just about figuring the right mix of your influencer marketing plan. Right. Um, actually, I want to move on to also now more details like trends. I know backstage we spoke about what is really nascent and what is really kind of moved ahead. So I, I know that uh, I read about social commerce, I read about micro influencers, even nano influencers as the smaller tier towns uh, open up. Um, what, do you, what is your view on the next couple of trends that we will see emerging in this? I mean, you can touch upon either or something new. We transfer mics <laughs> to, to find someone working. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, in my personal opinion, for the last 10 years, the um, influencer market, uh, marketing changed a lot. Now it is divided in different groups, in different categories, in different channels and the technology emerging at the moment and we don't know what will be tomorrow. Uh, they, in my personal opinion, the, the, the biggest opportunity and the same concern comes from artificial intelligence. Uh, content creation will be never be the same in the next uh, couple of years. And uh, I don't know if the audience likes uh, the content which will be created by AI or they won't like. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, anybody in this room has this answer, but we will see in the very, 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 uh, very early future. I think especially in the last couple of years uh, after COVID, yeah. there have been a lot of uh, category expertise that has come in uh, into the influencer domain. Yep. I think earlier uh, the, the mass volume was driven uh, by a lot of these uh, entertainment content creators. It still is to a large extent. But you now see a very, very large pool of, let's say, uh, creators specializing in, in the areas like finance, health, wellness, uh, even uh, you know, fashion and a bunch of these areas. So I think category expertise uh, is the new trend that we are seeing, especially in the last couple of years. Right. And especially in my category, finance. Right, right. Uh, so, Clean, what do you uh, say about this? I mean, uh, will uh, are micro influencers really uh, the smarter choice versus bigger marquee influencers on known platforms? I mean, is that the way forward now? It's come, I kind of come to boiling it down to smaller and smaller uh, kind of clusters. The big trend around expertise. I think the second trend is also about nostalgia. 
people do want to bring back a lot of the past. The third trend which I definitely see around is, you know, expertise which is now moving beyond just product, but a point of view, you know. And lastly, even if you see the influencers who are actually trending big time, right. they're all, they all know their audience really well. So if someone is funny, he knows his audience, he knows what people are looking from him. They're almost capturing in 60 seconds a full-on package of entertainment. Right. Now, question of which influencer is right for you, I think it all boils down to what is the problem you're trying to solve. If you're trying to build expertise, then clearly you need to have someone who has an influence but also has expertise. Right. If your objective is reach, then it's impossible to do that without the nanos and the micros. Correct. If your objective is people who can actually give people inspiration, then you would do it very differently. And the other trend that I think if you see even in the way Bollywood is leveraging influencers today, look at how songs are traveling. Every single song now becomes a song that influencers do in their way, memes come up. So that's how they're becoming part of pop culture. True, yeah. So I think people are leveraging the capabilities that are there to solve the problems they wish to solve. And I think the difference between those who are doing it well and those who I think are still learning on it I think it's exactly that. How right. well do you actually understand the creator economy? Right. But um, beyond that, are there any challenges when it comes to actually, I wouldn't say evaluating influencers, but let's say kind of fine balancing creators' trust that the audiences have in them and kind of balancing that with the company's values or the brand's values. I mean, that has always kind of been like a challenge. How do you now approach that? You know, I think it's a little counterintuitive if I tell this in a room and having been a marketer myself for most part of my career, I think, see, what we learned in our playbook was to always get the brand codes right, get the brand strategy right. But, you know, the important thing is to realize that these influencers are not your brand ambassadors. They are not people who people want to hear because they are coming up to do an ad film for you. The reason why people want to watch their content is precisely because they don't do that, right? And I think the more we realize that it's important not to pollute their content, it's important, right? And I think it's a very difficult one because when the person who's given the job of creating the influencer content, typically a brand manager or a brand head in a business, he looks at it very squarely from the lens of my KPI. Right. But then you have to marry that objective with what's really the creator's audience, right. you know? And how do you do it in a way that it really looks like he genuinely meant it? You know, you don't ever want them to fe have this feeling how Typically, you would see, like, so many people would always say, oh, really, Shah Rukh Khan, would he actually be using this? Exactly. You yeah. do not want that to happen to your creators, right? right? Because that's not a win-win. Yes. Not for yourself, not for the creator. Absolutely. Samir, you want to talk about that? So, um, I think broadly, there are two ways in which a brand can sort of integrate into an influencer channel. One is uh, when, uh, when the influencer or the creator uses uh, the, the product uh, as a consumer and then advocates it. I think there the only single lens we see is uh, can the consumers or the viewers believe that this particular creator is actually using this? So for example, uh, you know, a lot of times we see very, very wealthy celebrities advertising very uh, low cost value popular brands. Yeah, a lot of times there's a believability issue there. So I think one is believability, authenticity. Secondly, there are creators uh, who are advocating out of uh, their authority on the subject. Say, for example, uh, somebody who understands, uh, say, for example, insurance really well. Uh, there, uh, I think the only criteria is uh, whether people accept their authority on the subject or not. Because only if uh, people accept the creator's authority on the subject will, uh, will their uh, word have any influence. Right. Uh, I think broadly these two criteria uh, for these two sp uh, specific uses. Apart from that, I think uh, the basic check marks of being brand safe, etc. Right. Uh, Dima, would you want to address how to kind of evaluate, uh, how would you bring an influencer on board with your methods that you're kind of uh, known for? Uh, yeah, uh, I want to add to previous topic, one more thing. Uh, in the nearest future, uh, we can see the race of uh, virtual mascots or virtual mascots of the brands. 
And with the rise of Web3, uh, with the rise of uh, those technology, mm, you know, uh, in my personal opinion, we are at the border between when people like to talk to other people and when they studied, start, start to love to talk to AI bots and uh, mascots, virtual mascots and so on. Honestly, I'm on the side when I want to talk to people. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, all youngsters, they hate when somebody calling on the phone and uh, somebody talking to them and, th and that's all. Uh, yeah, about the collecting data. So for now, there are a lot of uh, different um, web services and software where you can uh, find out what is happening about you and your brand all over the internet, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. You can collect all this data analyze it and understand what is happening in the moment. But the biggest advantage is that you can find out what is happening with your uh, concrete, for example, influence marketing strategy. You can measure what is going on in the comments of the blogger or influencer. You can measure what do people discuss after the publishing and what they discuss in a week, in a month, and so on. Uh, so, as mentioned before, there are a lot of channels where you can grab the data and uh, yes, for now, it's not about, you know, somebody publish information about your brand or the history and so on. It's about what happens next and you have to measure it, you have to collect it and understand what do people think about you and your brand or maybe persona or maybe event and so on and what they will be thinking in the future seven days, one month, and so on. Yeah. So collecting data is, uh, you know, uh, one of the keys to success to understand the behavior of the users and uh, of all uh, yeah, of, of the whole audience which uh, watches your advertisement in marketing. Yeah. That's it. I think different brands would be at different uh, levels and in terms of their objectives, in terms of the way they work. Uh, so when Dima mentioned this about uh, measuring, uh, wh where do we stand on that today? Just to speak of return on influence, so to speak. Um, are the challenges the same that have been, let's say, a couple of years ago? Or has uh, there, there, there's been some kind of improvement in getting clarity uh, on how the returns are uh, coming in? I, I don't think there's a very simple one-line answer to this. I think it's different for different categories, different platforms, etc. I'll give an example from my category. Uh, so insurance is not something people usually buy on impulse, right? They, they don't really, while browsing, uh, encounter an insurance ad and say, okay, let me buy it. A couple of reasons. A, it's a very complicated category to buy. So people uh, need to be convinced about whether or not they need it. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, the ticket size usually tends to be high in some cases. It can reach up to 20, 25,000, 30,000 rupees and so on and so forth. Um, so this was the context and we've uh, seen uh, influencer marketing working very differently across different mediums. So I'll give you an example on YouTube. A lot of people do their uh, research before buying uh, any kind of insurance on YouTube. There are a lot of searches on YouTube, okay, uh, how to select the right term insurance. Uh, what uh, cover should I get for my health insurance and so on and so forth. Right? And there are plenty of creators uh, targeting those keywords and creating content uh, for people to understand uh, uh, the answer to these questions. So when it's intent based uh, and you can also leave a link for people to click. We've seen it working very well. We've actually seen a lot of very clearly attributable sales happening because of such uh, content integ integrations on YouTube purely because it's intent based. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, when it comes to a platform uh, where people discover a lot of things and people are not usually searching for, uh, uh, you know, a lot of specific content, say for example, something like a TikTok or, or uh, Instagram and so on and so forth. There, uh, it's, it's, it has been a tiny bit challenging because of two things, uh, because you're basically serving the uh, content to pretty much everyone who may or may not be inclined to even think about your category right now. So there's a lot of wastage there, number one. And uh, B, the, the length of the content needs, uh, you know, tends to be uh, relatively smaller. 
when people are looking to buy such a complicated category, they, they want to, uh, you know, uh, be very, very thorough with their research. They want to spend 10, 15 minutes understanding every aspect in detail, which they can do on uh, YouTube. And secondly, uh, the platform is designed in a way that uh, there's, there's no clickable link right there for people to click. And if you want people to go to the bio and then find the link and click it, you're adding one more step in the journey, which, which is a very cumbersome step for a lot of users, which also tends to uh, limit the consumer response from a content integration. So uh, I think that's where we are. Uh, when it comes to uh, impulse categories, uh, I've, I've seen some of those platforms also working very well, but not so much for my category. Yeah. I think <coughs> I'll go back to objectives again. If the objective is top of the funnel, then you may not have directly attributable ROI instantly, but you will see a distinct shift in the way consumers start perceiving your brand, right? But again, if it's a sales link campaign, if you're directing people to click-throughs onto a direct-to-consumer site or a marketplace site, your clicks are a very clear way to look at attribution. And if we are putting in the codes, you're giving the, the influencer codes there where people can shop from, then you can even link that to sale. Although my only submission on this one is that I'm not sure if there are too many organizations who would have tasted a lot of success in using influencers as a medium to sell. They are a very, very good medium to truly influence. And I think as long as we realize why are they doing what they're doing, I think we tend to manage the medium a lot better. Because if it becomes direct sales, then, they, then the whole process or the authenticity of it really starts to get compromised. You know, I mean, like, there are two aspects of it. One, I definitely would like to measure an impact on mind measures. You know, if through all the content that we were trying to publish, are the consumers genuinely more aware? Is the expertise actually getting transferred? Because, you know, today when people are buying into a product like insurance, which is a high ticket value, or if they're buying into skincare or makeup, which is high involvement category, people don't make the switch unless someone gives them an authentic point of view on why it's worked for them. So I think first thing for me is, is it really adding to that credibility that I like to build, right? And the second thing is, yeah, see, if for all the brands which are selling to digitally native consumers, you are also looking at attribution. So if there is a large campaign one is doing, one would also like to see the impact it made to searches, to clicks, to sales, right? Because then at least it gives you enough confidence to want to invest more money behind it. Yeah. Um, and we would like, uh, we like to measure our competitors. We want to study on their mistakes because it is so easy to collect all the data about what is happening in their field, what kind of mistakes they did, and uh, you can learn from that and do new mistakes. <laughs> yeah, new mistakes are always welcome. You can always learn. My last and final question is, uh, of course, on AI, because um, there's a lot of marketers I've spoken to who feel that it might in the future have some impact. They don't really know how, they've been reading up, uh, but they, they know that it's not, it's still very nascent. AI, perhaps generative AI has an impact on influencer marketing, but uh, what, what are the issues you would like it to solve for? What would you like it to mit uh, mitigate, if at all? You know, if I can just say, if it can you, you know, there are fakes are a big problem. If you can identify fakes and get, remove that subset because that dilutes the equity of those who are real. I think that's one big problem for it to solve for if it can. Um, so I agree. I think ad fraud is one space. The other one um, I think is about uh, measurement and attribution. Uh, a lot of things are being done manually. I think in some way I will be able to automate a lot of processes, etc. cetera. Um, also, I think, uh, see, this is on the demand side of influencer marketing, right? Also, I have a feeling uh, on the supply side of influencer marketing in terms of actual creation and uh, serving of content and identifying what cohorts of people would like what sort of content and, uh, you know, all of those spaces also, I think, will be revolutionized by AI in some way, generative AI, like you mentioned. Uh, there are plenty of uh, human face creators and then there are plenty of non-human face creators as well. There, there are... Uh, you know, uh, pages uh, uh, which publish statistics, world uh, statistics. There, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, 
pages that publish a lot of these uh, graphic sort of content. A lot of that, I think, uh, will uh, sort of somehow benefit from generative AI. Maybe even human face uh, creators in some way, you never know. Uh, I think we're only just starting in terms of AI. Uh, let's see, you know, maybe in the next couple of years, let's see where we get, but I have a feeling there will be some kind of major impact. Yeah, uh, so it's okay when uh, generative AI helps uh, influencers to simplify the process or find out something new in their analyze or measurement, something like that. But what if this generative AI, AI will get into the bad hands? Uh, for example, just a kid or student can produce the uh, content table for 200 and 300, 500 different uh, groups and publics in Facebook and so on. He, he can add a content in, in a second there and publish it everywhere. And sometimes the organic user comes there. And who takes responsibility for the content published there? That's the one of the biggest issues. My final one, just um, what kind of excites you in the next couple of years, um, be it tech, be it um, uh, just the power that uh, you have with all these creators out there, what kind of excites you, just in a quick word? I think there's so much that is still left unexplored, right? Like what programmatic can do, what the way attribution can be, measurability. In fact, even what Samir mentioned on the supply side, how do we make it easy for creators to monetize? because it's actually a humongous uh, revenue stream for so many people who can monetize their worth. So I think in terms of possibilities, we're just literally scratching the surface. There's still lots that still needs to happen. And India is one market where you actually see people creating a lot of content, right? So I think in terms of possibilities, the possibilities are immense. Uh, I think a couple of things could be very exciting. Uh, so, especially again after COVID, we've seen a massive increase in the follower base of a lot of uh, big creators. So, there were plenty of creators during COVID who went from 10 million on YouTube, let's say, to a 20 million. Now, there are a few. Back then, you could hardly name maybe one. So, I think a lot of these massive new creators becoming extremely big, some of them, in terms of their reach, are as big as a small TV channel in terms of the actual number of impressions. So I think uh, these mega creators, I think uh, when they become sizable in number, is when we will see the, uh, we will see the real shift in ad spend. You know, Abhi, I think it's, uh, not, uh, it's not even scratching the surface. I think there's a lot of room uh, to grow. And secondly, I think, uh, I'm not sure if somebody is doing this already or not, but uh, some ed techs in a way, created a lot of online teachers by hiring them, uh, teaching them how to, uh, you know, uh, interact with kids online and teach them and so on and so forth and created sort of armies of uh, teachers. Maybe there's an opportunity waiting to be tapped by somebody sort of aggregating a lot of uh, creators and creating new creators, creating new armies of creators. I think that could also uh, sort of uh, make the space explode. Suffice to say, there's a lot of headroom. Thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us. That's the end of the session. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Shalini Pillai Banerjee, Head of Consumer Apps Marketing, Google India. Very warm welcome to you, Shalini. Sumit Singh, Group Chief Marketing Officer, InfoEdge India Limited. A very warm welcome to you, Sumit. Please have a seat at the dais. And let's welcome our moderator for this session, Rajat Mathur, partner, BCG. Over to you, Rajat. Right, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being part of our, coming down for our panel. So let's set it up there. Uh, while you were just discussing before this panel, uh, marketing, marketers actually have been using data science, ML, data, and all kind of number games, they have been using it for a while. And thus, they have been using it effectively to at least push back to the CFO about the effectiveness of their campaigns, or to be a little bit more relevant and, and, and ensuring that they have the right competitive advantage while reaching out to their customers, 
or to let's say have a more detailed or a more value oriented campaigns for their end, end customers there. So all this numbers, data, analytics, analysis has been there for a while. So let's just use this panel just to understand that with the help of AI, how are we deepening this engagement with our customers? How are we better realizing the value of our marketing initiatives? So let's start with Shalini. Shalini, we'll start with you. So we have been seeing digital marketing for some time now. It's been there for at least five odd years since I have seen that. How have you seen this digital marketing getting transformed with AI and now more importantly with Gen AI? I, you know, like you rightly said, for the last five years, AI has been there, right? And it's still an evolving technology. Um, early use cases have always been around SEO, which is why the company exists. <laughs> um, and as we start looking at it, it's been helping on media targeting, media management, you know, budgeting and stuff like that. But more increasingly, there's an the trend beyond digital marketing is actually what we've seen with consumers. Today, there is a explosion, right? An absolute explosion of platforms that are coming across. Consumers are starting to see things in 15 seconds to 15 hours. And as a marketer, you need to be relevant over there. This is where I think a combination of both AI and more recently Gen AI kind of can lean in even more, more specifically onto content, right? Because you need that content to be relevant to that user. Um, and what Gen AI can do is actually help in content, which you know, I call the three Vs, which is velocity, volume, and variation, velocity. right? Uh, with Gen AI, you can now start take, taking your core creative and start building it out, multiply it into whatever True. format you want to do. True. And so you can focus on what you want to do, right? right. Uh, we've also been looking at how AI can help on creative uh, testing, campaign optimization, mm -hmm. um, and measurement, of course. Uh, the other big piece, it actually opens up your mind to creativity, right? Uh, I have my, one of my favorite campaigns, it's on hyper-personalization, which has been Mondelez. Right. Sumit is going to talk about her. I just told her what my favorite yeah. campaign of hers was. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, of course, you've had Nike, right, which yeah. has got this. So it opens up everything. Mm -hmm. Marketing is always about connecting brand with the user. Right. So the what has not changed, it's just the how. It's just the how. Interesting. Very good point. So let's just see about the how part and Sumit will start with you on this that we have been seeing this uh, personalization uh, being used over and again. Now of course there were words like hyper-personalization, ML or AI-led hyper-personalization. What kind of a recent trends you are seeing based on your experience in the market which are driving this hyper-personalization at scale? So I think at least the businesses where uh, which we run, mm -hmm. uh, our customers and our consumers have always expected a personalized experience, right? Sure. Anybody coming on to Nokri feels recommendations should be personalized to me, right? Uh, and uh, similarly for Jeevan Sathi, mm -hmm. I'm looking for a match. I've told you what I want. Uh, it has to be absolutely that, right? So I think about a decade ago, what you realized was that you started doing two-way matching uh, you started doing more collaborative models, right, True. rather than just parametric models. Mm -hmm. uh, what your consumers are expecting today is hyper-personalization. And I think that is a big, um, I think it starts from really the social media channels. You know, you look at Insta Reels, you look at Facebook, you look at a lot of properties on YouTube, etc. Uh, they've kind of personalized it so well for you mm -hmm. that if you get your first search right, mm -hmm. uh, it really gets what you like, right? What Correct. is your taste in music? It'll keep surfing that. You don't have to keep putting in mm -hmm. stuff. And that has spoiled the consumer for hyper-personalization. Okay. So I think with the, so we've been using AI actually now for about 12 years, right? Uh, we did our first predictive models for marketing way back actually in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're now seeing is that with the use of certain technologies, uh, you can actually go to each level and you don't just need cohorts now. Mm -hmm. So user journeys are getting better defined. You know, something that we were all talking in the speaker's yeah. lounge was about uh, how the same ad or the same notification or the same message on WhatsApp can now be served to all three of us with the same message, but with images that we like, right? So the offer is same, the message is same, but today it is enabling uh, a team to kind of hyper-personalize. Uh, we've also used it a lot on the marketing front, right? Mm -hmm. We've kind of just used uh, Gen AI very recently for a campaign in Jeevan Sathi, 
which we did with an influencer, of course, called Nimrit Khera, mm -hmm. and uh, a company, you know, which enables technology. Um, and we actually, because Punjab has five or six dialects, so on our business, which is Jeevan Sathi, it's not just vernacular, it's because it's people belonging to certain castes and certain communities. Uh, they're very particular about this dialect is not mine, mm -hmm. so this is not seeming you know, this is not the Vabba Punjabi or this is not here or mm -hmm. things like that. So we could actually use AI technologies to get to that level. So it wasn't just language but dialect level. I don't think we could have done something like that if some of the newer age Gen AI technologies were not there. And we saw great success, you know. We kind of, yeah. on our business metrics, we saw um, registrations from Punjab grow by 35% in that week. So it worked as well, right? Yeah. So those are some of the things that we are kind of uh, using for hyper personalization. Very interesting. So it's a segment of one or a one is to one. We have been talking about segment of one also for some time, but now it's one is uh, one person, but maybe different ways of targeting it and maybe leveraging some influencers along with AI to have a better dent in the uh, on that front. Yeah. Interesting. So let's keep building on that. Now we talk about the hyper personalization on the consumer front on that side. Let's just walk you through the entire consumer journey. Within this consumer journey, what all other areas you think uh, are being impacted by AI? I mean, it's the era of everything, everywhere, all at once, right? <laughs> so you kind only. of have to think um, every piece that is starting to happen. And, you know, Sumit talked about it, yeah. notifications. Um, yeah. So the first part that we had talked about was campaigns and making campaigns mm -hmm. that are personalized that mm -hmm. are there. But anything and everything that you're starting to look at them, mm -hmm. it starts coming in over there. So the consumer's journey is not unidimensional, right? It's across different platforms, it's across different things that they're starting to do. Right. Um, one of the things that we keep doing on Google Pay is actually run a lot of on-app programs. So how many of you all have scratched my favorite card, scratch card? No? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, those are actually multiple experiments that we're able to run simply because of AI. Right? We are actually looking at each data, looking at what can actually work in terms of signals, what's the kind of metric you're trying to do, which actually helps to optimize ROI. Um, we look at the same thing when we're running our gamification campaigns because the way to communicate to your user is not always the same. Right? Mm -hmm. That 130 character you're sending on notification can actually be that zero, zero cost media channel that drives a lot more revenue for you. And thinking through that copy is also extremely important. Got it. So I think that's what the consumer journey, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you have to start thinking how you're starting to inform them relevant to that need. Context is extremely important at right. that time. So if we see that's what's been changing quite a so bit. So you have been doing these experiments like A, B, C, D, E, and you can do any number of tests now. So uh, are these, some of these experiments also can be short-circuited with AI? Like for example, why do I have to run this uh, campaign on 20 cohorts? Can I just have some simulators from AI who can help me reduce this from 20 cohort to let's say five cohorts? I think the fact is you can have thousand experiments running at the same time. So I wouldn't call the duration being the issue. Mm -hmm. The fact that you can actually break down your entire audience into multiple sizes and segments mm -hmm. and learn from them can learn work. From, right. And then actually build what is scaling, right? So that's what's important. I think what can start happening is that you're able to scale faster because you're able to learn faster also. Interesting, got it. Now, Sumit, let's uh, uh, keep building on this. Uh, one of the other things, and you touched about Gen AI. Now, Gen AI has been, uh, we have been seeing, I mean, I think in that, uh, while, while she was introducing us, she also talked about Gen AI. Help us understand, uh, what is the real potential of Gen AI? Is it really, really making a, a dollar impact or a rupee impact on, uh, on the people who are using it? Or is it too early or is it just another hype like many other technologies have been in past? I wish I knew the potential, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> because I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, so we are using Gen AI in three, four different areas. Uh, one area is uh, performance marketing, you know, uh, and it's already shown us great results, uh, both in terms of efficiency, you know, as Shalini said, the f you don't want to limit your cohorts actually because it enables you to actually now from 100 cohorts go to 10,000 cohorts and actually hyper-personalize, right? And then there are tools that allow you to do creatives for scale as well because even if you could cohort earlier with AI, you did not have a way that you could actually generate 1,000 creatives in two hours 
and put them out on a Google AdWords account right. or on Insta. So we're seeing a lot of efficiency in performance, uh, which is very easy to gauge. It's led to about 30 to 35 percent gains in certain businesses like 99 acres, which is real estate and therefore e extremely hyper local by its nature itself. True. You know, um, then we're using it as brand managers. Yeah. We're using it for better content generation. We're using tools like Mid Journey. We're using tools like Synthesia mm. for videos. We have a, a business in the Gulf, you know, Nokri Gulf, uh, and the marketing team sits here. Uh, so it's not very easy to get that dialect. Whenever we do something in Bombay with the VO artists, people living in Sharjah or in Dubai know that this is not a person who's from here, mm. right? Um, and we've kind of turned out 28 videos in two days with a genie, we've called her Nadia, you know, so Synthesia's kind of given us that, right? Um, I don't know what it is going to result in, in terms of results, because we've just put it out two weeks ago. But as a marketing team, it's enabling us to do a lot of content, uh, which is saving us actually production costs and agency retainership fee. Uh, but you know, uh, does it mean that you don't need humans? No. no. But I think you need uh, more skilled, maybe lesser number of people. Yeah. The other place where we are seeing a lot of use of it in marketing process automation, mm. uh, right? And I think uh, that leads to a tremendous amount of efficiency. Uh, what will it mean in terms of dollars? I don't know. But we are seeing early uh, things. Then on our platform, we are using, so we've got GPT-4, we're talking to BARD, um, and we're, of course, using the enterprise versions because you don't want your business Correct. data basically Correct. to be fueling sure. the LLMs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, we're also using a lot of open source LLMs, right? Makes we're sense. doing Llama yeah. 2. Mm. We're seeing how that can help us uh, generate better recommendations. Right. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that we are actually doing. Mm. We have about, we've put in a Gen AI lab. We have 52 data scientists who are working on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're seeing what all are the possibilities. But uh, today it seems interesting. What is the potential? I don't think Jan also yeah. knows as yet. Yeah. Right? I think we need a crystal ball for that. But at least early signs have been fairly encouraging. Yes. I think 30, 35 percent efficiency yes. Is, yes. is something worth uh, going through. And perhaps uh, the speed will let uh, you to do more experimentation as well. Yeah, and productivity. productivity because productivity is also man hours, right? Yeah. You know? Correct. Yeah. Like we've all first started off with having 30 second ads and then having the 15 second and 5 seconds. 5 seconds, right? yeah. <laughs> do now having 10,000 assets and it's crazy the crazy. amount of time that's been put in Correct. to kind of do that. You're removing the grunt work. It's actually, Correct. that's where I feel, you know, like Sumit said, the process automation really, really helps. Yeah, moving the better. grunt work and making it meaningful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the output is meaningful yeah. there. So let's just keep uh, moving on this. So uh, help me with this. Like for example, there's so much talk about data and AI. How are organization ensuring that the data privacy, customer privacy is being maintained and thoroughly being scrutinized? That's a fantastic question and something that we deeply, deeply, deeply care about. And it's not just us, right? It's also the regulators. So, yeah. There's, um, a lot of the focus has been in terms of how you make sure that you're protecting because data is, uh, at the end of it, um, you know, a commodity, it doesn't become a commodity to mm -hmm. when you expand it to people that don't, are not responsible for it. So I think that's what it means. You have to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And at Google, the way, the way we've been thinking about it is that it always needs to, thinking about in a privacy first mm -hmm. environment, and what does that really mean? That really means user opt-in. Mm -hmm. A user will opt-in to share data if they find it useful, if they find it helpful. We've mm -hmm. actually seen data actually suggests that 67% of all users are willing uh, to trust a, a brand uh -huh. if they opt in for that particular piece, right? So it, it, is, it, is, uh -huh. it is permission from them to do something that's right for them. So I think that's where it is. And when you do have the data, uh -huh. you do need to apply the conversion modeling on it, right? So you are focused in a very, very responsible way of making it happen, which is useful, uh -huh. but not spammy, right? So uh -huh. I think that's where we are thinking about it. Very good. I think uh, one of these concerns, I think 67% is a big number. Uh, people are trusting the brand and obviously brands have to be equally responsible on that front. Now, uh, Sumit, let's just uh, talk a bit more on this because I believe uh, no AI conversation at this stage can be complete or concluded without talking about responsible AI. So 
what's your thoughts as how organizations are dealing with uh, the responsible AI charter, what kind of a strategy, what kind of a frame they are talking about, and what kind of a implementation challenges that they are facing on this? So, you know, as BARD and Chat GPT, I think both keep ensuring us organizations that everything's hashed. We will not, we can't read anything. We will not train our algorithms. On your, on your data. Yeah, yeah but um, we're not too sure. <laughs> there are two big wall gardens. Uh, they're saying something today, yeah. tomorrow to monetize, they can say anything else. Uh, so we're not, and I won't use a strong word as trust, but we're kind of not very comfortable at the moment sharing any of our data with any of these two big models, LAN, though we have the enterprise version of both. And therefore, we are using the open source models on our own data. We, of course, can never um, afford the kind of investments that you've made into processing because LLM requires a lot of processing. Yeah, uh, but we do have two GPU. I mean, we've ordered two GPU servers. God knows when they'll <laughs> come. Uh, but we don't need the whole hog. We can operate from level three, level four, so we don't need all the layers. I think layer three, layer four is where we are processing. Um, so we, we're not at the moment comfortable at all sharing uh, any of the data uh, that is of our users, right? On the other hand, there are a lot of tools that I spoke about. Um, there we are not sharing any personal data because we are using it for productivity, we are using it for content generation, etc. I think we're more comfortable there. Uh, on the other side, and that is the reason we've set up our own Gen, I, Gen AI labs, because we feel a lot of open source will keep coming and we'll keep training that data on our own servers because as yet, uh, we're not very comfortable actually putting our data out. Um, right. So, right. No, I think, uh, and, and Shalini, if you want to add anything, uh, go ahead and waste that. I think cam we've seen effectiveness of campaigns when you use first party data. Right. right. So, as long as yeah. that, the outperformance of that is extremely high. So, when you think about it, think about it from a responsible, think about what you'll do with it. And I think, Correct. you know, to everyone's concerns, you need to make sure that it doesn't look like you're actually misusing it. That is, that's why the key thing on responsible AI, you have to be bold, but you have to be responsible. Absolutely. And I think uh, more and more organizations are putting up, uh, as uh, Sumit said, there is a Gen AI lab, but they're putting up, I would say, custodians there to ensure that uh, there is a responsible AI charter. There are minimal to no biases uh, coming out from their models. So they act as the data science is acting or AI is acting in a more responsible way. So folks, I think that's pretty much, I'll just conclude in the last minute that uh, I think both, uh, both of them wonderfully summarized or, mention or talk about how AI has been transforming the marketing. As uh, uh, Shalini started saying that, well, it's data, data science, ML was there for some time. It's not that something new there. Even for digital marketing, this has been used for that. But as we progress further, I think the depth of usage and the value realization has been significantly up. I think some of the numbers we said, uh, I think wonderful, quite encouraging to hear that even a new technology like a Gen AI is really making the dent on the top or a bottom line, be it from your efficiency perspective, be it from your hyper-personalization, or as Shalini again mentioned that, the grunt work of 10,000 ads being created, uh, created wonderfully and yet being meaningful to the end users on that front. And of course, uh, uh, the customer, the, the consumer uh, privacy, the customer privacy, data privacy remains the top uh, priority for, I think that's a CEO agenda, both uh, uh, customer privacy, data privacy, and the responsible AI. And hopefully we see that uh, all these new technology, along with other technology come up to deliver the transformative value. And that's what we say, the technology being a disruptive or transformative for us, yet in a responsible and a contextual way. So that's pretty much from our side, folks. Thank you so much for being part of our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the panelists for uh, quite brilliantly mentioning that how AI has been a transformative tool for your marketing strategies. So with this, before we move towards our last keynote session, very quickly, I would like to take a poll. How many of you have been tweeting live with us using the hashtag, hashtag what's new, or perhaps posting on LinkedIn? Give me a quick raise of hands, please. One, two, three. Wow, fantastic. So happy to know that. All right, so on that note, moving on towards our last keynote session.
For the same, I would like to invite on stage Dima Rakita, CEO, Reputation House. Let's give a very warm welcome as Mr. Rakita joins us here. Over to you, Dima. Okay, hello. My name is uh, Dima Rakita. Yeah, I'm the CEO of Reputation House. We do online uh, reputation management. We do social media listening. Uh, we manage the Google result page. Uh, and um, we do some kind of uh, mention reviews. Yeah, we have opened three offices uh, for the last four years. Uh, they are in Hong Kong, in Dubai, and New York. And we manage the reputation of uh, big brands, personas, and events uh, all over the world for the last uh, 10 years, something like that. Uh, OK, so the next slide. OK, uh, this is the biggest gap uh, which uh, we are trying to bridge. This is how you see. Oops, what is happening? Oh, can, 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 can we get it back? OK, nice. Uh, this is how we see our companies, our personas, our brand, ourselves. And uh, if you don't pay attention to our reputation, this is how our customers see your brand. And this is the biggest gap, uh, this uh, interference which we try to fix, uh, try to bridge. Uh, so maybe I put the... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what is reputation? Reputation is the belief of opinions, uh, which is uh, held about someone or something. And uh, who cares? Uh, cons consumers and your customers care, business care, uh, your partners care about your reputation, stockholders, marketers, journalists, and one of the most efficient things are employers. Uh, your reputation as an employer brand is also very important and uh, very less companies take care about them. Uh, and for sure you care. So what kind of concepts of reputation we have? Uh, one of the, my most interesting topic is reputation attacks. Uh, then comes public relations, online reviews, content removing, and this is very interesting word. I have studied it just half a year ago. It is called astroturfing. What is astroturfing? It is when a lot of negative comments appear all over the social media, Facebook and so on. So you even don't notice on the pages of different girls and boys, uh, they start to appear uh, very strange uh, comments about your brand about the employers of your brand, about your events, and so on. And you're missing them. You're missing them, but people start to discuss about what happened in the internet. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Uh, yeah, the brands forget about that it's very important to build the relationships between uh, customer and the company. Uh, Starbucks, a very good company who brings uh, uh, loyalty program and uh, it leads uh, to increased brand loyalty. So we see a lot of different memes all over the internet about the Starbucks. Yeah, uh, Dove made a good connection between ages and forms, produced uh, their real beauty campaign. McDonald's asked uh, in uh, comments under their videos and their advertisement, what do people think about their food? They asked uh, the community to ask questions, and they published all these, uh, uh, all these questions uh, in, uh, their, uh, in their McDonald's, yeah. Uh, role of the internet, yeah. Uh, the internet can amplify negative sentiments rapidly, and that is uh, uh, one of the, one of the things which every brand should take care uh, to listen the social media about what is happening. Because if you lose and don't react on timing, uh, it can ruin all your reputation and then ruin your business. Uh, United Airlines, yeah, this is the case who, about which everybody is talking, but <laughs> I cannot miss it and let's, let's see what is happening. Uh, in United Airlines there was a case uh, when there was one of the passenger was not allowed to fly because uh, there were no uh, tickets and so on. And they just picked him from the plane 
and bring back to the airport and uh, in the social media the video about how, how they perform it uh, flooded all of the internet. And what happened? Incident date on the 9th of April. This is the stock market. This is the stock market of United Airlines. This is the market uh, share price. And uh, after the incident, the market shares go down. Just one tweet, and United Airlines doesn't do anything for the next couple of days, as you see, and their shares going down. Uh, yeah. The whole internet was flooded uh, with the memes like this one. United Airlines have a fight club uh, in uh, their plane. Yeah, and uh, the here how many mentions uh, were fixed in the uh, social media listening tools. More than 100K, uh, just, just one station and one uh, tweet, yeah. And when the CEO apologized, the market share goes back. About 250 million US dollar, the cost of one mistake, and when you didn't make a proper reaction in time. Uh, yeah, uh, honestly, I prepared uh, the slides for around 40 minutes, but <laughs> but I understand that uh, uh, I don't have a lot of time. Yeah, I will share with you uh, the topic which I discussed uh, during the. Uh, panel discussion, yeah? Uh, so, this is the tools for social media listening. Uh, the, the every, uh, every company and every person, it's not, it, it, the price is not very high. Everybody can afford it to listen what is happening in the internet about your brand, about your product, and what, do your, uh, what do you, your customers say about you. But moreover, you can look after your rivals, you can uh, look after your employers, you can look after your market and what, do, what, what your competitors do. Because these uh, social media listening tools, they can collect data all over the internet and, uh, and describe what is happening in mentions, to describe your audience, show the loyalty, what do they say in positive, negative and so on, what kind of sources, for example, your company is being discussed only in Facebook or your product only in Twitter, with the geography, for example, Twitter in Germany, Facebook in India, and so on. All this da data can be provided to you very easily in a, in, a in, in, in a couple of minutes, and you will get some kind of these graphics. Uh, here are the days. Here the amount of mentions, red are negative, green are positive about your brand. The system understands when do people say something bad or something good about you and your brand. And here you can study all the information about, about your brand, what do people say. Not what you think about your company, what do people say. And with this data you can change your strategy in social media networks, in social media marketing, and so on, yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't have a lot of time, but I, I have a lot of um, different um, problems and solutions. Uh, probably I can, I can share, my, uh, share my presentation with you and uh, the organizers will uh, send it to you. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me. Okay, thank you, sorry. Thank you, thank you so much, Dima. So with this, as we have come to an end of this very knowledge-packed day, I truly hope that you have managed to gather some really fresh perspectives and valuable insights. Yes? Has it been a fruitful evening for all of you? Fantastic. So with this, uh, we have come to an end, and now I would like to announce that the bar is open. The bar is here on the left-hand side of the ballroom. The dinner is being served right outside near the pre-function area. With this, thank you so much once again for joining us here. I believe that our exploration does not end here. In fact, it's the continuation of the exciting journey that lies ahead. So have safe travels, stay curious, and keep pushing the boundaries of digital innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much once again for being such a lovely audience. This is your host, Namruta, signing off on behalf of Kid Global and EconomicTimes.com. Thank you so much once again for joining us here. Please grab your drinks and make the most of this opportunity to network 
network with each other and forge some really amazing connections. Thank you.